The subcommittee will come to order. Today we will hear from industry. Let me come to order and I will recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Today we'll hear from industry experts on healthcare providers, large and small, about our healthcare cybersecurity. This is especially important considering recent events. On February 21, our healthcare system experienced one of the largest cyber attacks known to date. Change Healthcare, a subsidiary of United Health, experienced a ransomware attack that resulted in substantial disruption to the healthcare industry. United Healthcare Group took three key systems offline, impacting claims processing, payment and billing, and eligibility verifications. The disruption that ensued caused patients to go without access to medications or experiencing higher than expected out-of-pocket costs for these daily medications. Providers, large and small, were, went unpaid, and in some cases still haven't been made whole, and patients experienced delays accessing care they otherwise would be eligible to receive. To put this in greater context, Change Healthcare alone processed 15 billion healthcare claims annually that are linked to providers and hospitals across the country. My office and I have personally heard from constituents impacted. In one such instance, an independent provider in my hometown of Bowling Green is still grappling with the fallout from the attack. His practice is losing staff because they can't make payroll while systems are getting back online. I am concerned that we still don't know how much sensitive information may have been compromised, and I'm committed to continue our work alongside the Department of Health and Human Services and our private sector partners, including United Health, to assess the damage caused by the ransomware attack. I am equally committed to working to ensure healthcare providers are doing all they can to stop these ransomware attacks in their tracks. These attacks are nothing new to the healthcare system. According to HHS data, large data breaches increased by more than 93 percent between 2018 and 2022, with a 278 percent increase in large breaches reported at HHS Office of Civil Rights involving ransomware from 2018 to 2022. One of the primary drivers of the alarming increase in ransomware attacks is the payout the perpetrators demand in exchange for retrieving the stolen information, which in the case of change attack, allegedly resulted in a $22 million payday for the sophisticated dark web group Alpha V. The, the average healthcare data breach now costs an average of $10 million, which has increased by 53% in the past three years, according to a 2023 report by IBM. The federal government's response to protect agent cyber threats targeting our healthcare system has been lagging relative to the serious threat posed by some threats, especially by adversarial nations. On July 2022, alert, a July 2022 alert issued by key national security agencies underscored this reality, uncovering that a North Korean state-sponsored ransomware attack targeted assets responsible for housing, electronic health records, diagnostic services, and imaging services. Another attack against an Ohio-based healthcare system led to the cancellation of surgeries and diverted care for patients seeking emergency services. The Biden administration published a national strategy document last year outlining steps the federal government will take to bolster cyber readiness. That culminated in HHS issuing a four-step plan to strengthen our health care cyber defenses in December of last year, including establishing voluntary sector cybersecurity performance goals, providing resources to incentivize and implement best practices, and increasing enforcement and accountability efforts within the agency. I think we need to be very deliberate when thinking through the balance of incentives and penalties and accountability. To be clear, I appreciate the administration's continued work in the, this critical space. However, I can't help but wonder if we could have avoided the most recent event if these steps were taken much sooner. While I don't ever believe it is ever too little too late, we have our work cut out for us to ensure our healthcare system is a global leader in cyber security and patient safety and Americans' privacy remains front and center. I look forward to today's discussion on each of these important issues, and I will yield back. The chair will now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Chair uh, Ranking Member Eshoo, for five minutes for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, colleagues. Uh, today, we're going to discuss the dire need uh, for stronger cybersecurity measures in the healthcare sector following a major cyber attack on Change Healthcare in February that ground 
uh, medical claims processing, <clears throat> excuse me, to a halt. Change operates the largest clearinghouse for medical claims uh, in the United States and reviews 15 billion, with a B, uh, medical claims annually. Its network encompasses more than 900,000 physicians, 118,000 dentists, 33,000 pharmacies, 5,500 hosp uh, hospitals, and 600 labs. Change is a uh, subsidiary of Optum Insight, which is owned by United Health Group, a healthcare behemoth that, among other entities, owns commercial insurer United Health and PBM Optum RX. On February 21st of this year, Change disconnected uh, over 100 systems after detecting a cyber attack within its networks that likely compromised sensitive patient data. Effects of the cyber attack uh, reverberated across the country within hours, with hospitals, pharmacies, and physician practices losing up to $1 billion, with a B, dollars a day. Today, most systems are back online, and claims processing <coughs> is underway again for many providers, but the full impact of the cyber attack remains to be seen. United Health hasn't confirmed the volume or type of patient data that was compromised. It's been report, uh, reported up to four terabytes of data may have been stolen, and there are new unverified claims that other bad actors also have possession of the stolen data. On March 13th, um, the Office of Civil Rights at HHS announced it would investigate whether United Health failed to comply with privacy and security standards under HIPAA. It's good to know that HHS is also working um, to address the cash flow crunch caused by the attack by offering accelerated and advanced payments. This is very important and uh, obviously helpful. United Health was a target because of its size. It's the largest health company in the world by revenue, and uh, since the early 2000s, it's been consolidating uh, healthcare services under its subsidiary, Optum. The attack shows how United Health's anti-competitive practices present a national security risk because its operations now extend through every point of our healthcare system. The cyber attack laid bare the vulnerability of our nation's healthcare infrastructure. The healthcare sec uh, sector is a hacker's playground because it offers services that people need and handles a massive amount of medical records which sell on the dark web for $60 a pop. At the same time, healthcare organizations do not invest in cybersecurity. The average hospital uh, spends 6% of their operating budget on information technology and cybersecurity, a fraction for most health systems grossing millions in revenue each year. According to the uh, American Hospital Association, uh, cyber attacks against hospitals increased by 57% in 2022. About 90% of hospitals have had at least one data breach, and 45% of hospitals experienced five or more in a single year. The average data breach costs $11 million resulting from missed revenue and system upgrades. Cyber attacks also put patients' lives at risk, delaying needed care and forcing patients to transfer to alt uh, alternate care settings, despite significant increase in cyber attacks perpetrated against the healthcare sector, a lesson holds true. We spend more money cleaning up a mess after it happens rather than paying for less inexpensive prevention measures up front. It's not a question of if a cyber attack uh, will happen. It's a question of when. Healthcare organizations are long overdue to institute strong cybersecurity measures and enhanced data security to safeguard patient information. This, uh, 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 what's taken place, uh, should serve as a wake-up call to the healthcare sector. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about how reforms can be implemented without further delay. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you. The gentlelady yields back, and the chair, I now recognize the chair of the full committee, Chair Rogers, for five minutes for our opening statement. Thank you, everyone, for being here today to discuss cybersecurity and healthcare and the recent Change Healthcare cyber attack. While I'm disappointed that United Health Group chose not to make anyone available to testify today so that the committee and the American people could hear directly from them about how the specific cyber attack occurred, I will note United Health briefed ENC members recently on the matter and have committed to testifying at a future hearing. Healthcare cybersecurity was already a concern before change, the change attack, and I look forward to today's discussion about what the federal government, doctors, hospitals, and others have done right, and where there is opportunity to improve the resiliency of the healthcare sector. The change healthcare cyber attack is not just the most recent case of ransomware targeting our healthcare system, and due to changes integration with so many of our healthcare providers and payers, it is still impacting providers and healthcare organizations across the country. I have heard concerns from providers, rural hospitals, and many others, all worried about what this cyber attack means for them. And just this morning, the change, tech, the change health hackers were posting stolen data from the ransomware attack. There are still many unanswered questions and lessons to be learned from this attack. How did this attack gain entry to the change system? How can hospitals, doctors, and others best protect themselves? What other third parties do our nation's healthcare providers rely upon if taken offline could have a similar negative impact on the US healthcare system? Healthcare infrastructure is crucial for patients receiving the care they need. And sadly, this will likely not be the last breach or ransomware attack that will happen. Patient data is valuable and it is housed online. That is why we must continue to examine healthcare cybersecurity and make sure that patient data remains protected. HHS has overall responsibility for ensuring cybersecurity within healthcare across the United States federal government. And the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, or ASPR, has been designated the one-stop shop responsible for leading and coordinating the cybersecurity efforts, both within HHS and external partners. However, there seems to be multiple offices and agencies that have some role in cyber response. The Office of Civil Rights, the HHS Chief Information Officer, the Office of National Coordinator, and then the most recent response, CMS, all played a role. As our healthcare system becomes more consolidated, the impacts of cyber attacks, if successful, may be more widespread, pulling in even more agencies and offices within HHS. This committee has led at examining cybersecurity across all se sectors. In 2019, Congress made explicit that part of the responsibilities of ASPR is preparedness and response to cyber attacks. In 2020, a bill led by Dr. Burgess, which passed through this committee, encouraged healthcare organizations to adopt strong cybersecurity best practices. Last Congress, this committee worked to give FDA more authority over cybersecurity of medical devices. And more recently, in the reauthorization of the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act, reported by this committee, we made it explicit that cybersecurity should be considered and prioritized as a part of ASPR's National Health Security Strategy. And the Energy and Commerce Committee will continue leading the way in examining this issue. I hope we can use this hearing today to learn more about the change healthcare cyber attack and the response. Is it a unique situation? What do providers and patients need to know and look out for? I don't want this committee to be back here in five or 10 years after more patients' healthcare is disrupted by known criminal actors finding vulnerabilities in cybersecurity of our healthcare system. To prevent that, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about what can healthcare learn from other sectors are there more federal authorities HHS needs? What is the best balance to get better adoption of existing cybersecurity practices? And I look forward to the discussion and yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, the gentlelady yields back. And I believe we're, uh, the ranking member of the full committee is en route. So we're gonna pause for just a couple of minutes so he has opportunity to do his opening statement. I think he's, 
your caucus meeting went a little long, I hear. So anyway, he's on his way, so we'll give him a couple minutes. So the Thank you. The committee will come back to order and give you a couple of seconds for the <laughs> ranking member. You're next on line. So the chair will now recognize the ranking member of the full committee for his opening statement. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, today we're discussing health sector cybersecurity in the aftermath of the cyber attack on change healthcare. And the committee has a long history of examining the cybersecurity of critical infrastructure sectors within our jurisdiction. We've discussed strategies to harden critical infrastructure, and we've wrestled with the reality that interconnected information systems within healthcare and other sectors have increased the threat and potential harms of cyber attacks. However, I don't think that anyone anticipated that access to care and the financial stability of a variety of healthcare providers nationwide could be harmed by one single point of failure. And like most of my colleagues, I've heard concerns from patients and providers that the attack created barriers to access to care in my district. For example, in the days following the attack, one of my constituents in Highlands, New Jersey, who has type 1 diabetes, was told by every pharmacy in his community that he had to pay up to $1,200 for a 600-count bundle of glucose sticks used to test his blood sugar because none of the pharmacies could access his Medicare Part D benefits. And this left him with the impossible choice of trying to come up with the money to pay for these strips or potentially face life-threatening complications from his inability to test his blood sugar. And he's not alone. Reports from patients and providers across the country make clear that the aftermath of the cyber attack forced many to struggle with similar health impacting and potentially life-threatening choices. And this must never happen again as a result of a single cyber attack. It's critical that we take whatever action is necessary to reduce the risk to our healthcare systems from cyber attacks. Understanding that the health sector will continue to be an attractive target to cyber criminals and nation state actors. And I'm interested in learning more about what's currently working, what lessons we have learned in the aftermath of the change healthcare cyber attack, and what is the path forward in improving the resiliency of our healthcare system. I also want to hear more about whether the requirements for specific minimum cybersecurity standards are necessary for certain healthcare entities, and whether consolidation of health technology companies poses unreasonable risk to our healthcare systems. As consolidation continues throughout the healthcare system, I'm concerned that there are fewer redundancies in our system and more vulnerability to the entire system if entities like United Health Group are compromised. I'm, I'm extremely disappointed, I have to say, that United Health Group did not send a representative to today's hearing. 
They have a critical perspective and insights into the existing vulnerabilities of our healthcare system. And they could also answer some lingering questions that we continue to hear from providers as their response to the attack continues. And I'm particularly interested in questions related to recent reports of a second ransom demand on change healthcare and whether any unsecured data was compromised. Yesterday, I joined other bipartisan committee leaders in a letter to United Health Group demanding answers on the change healthcare cyber attack and its resulting harm on the US healthcare system. We need answers from the company because change healthcare's platforms touch an estimated one in three US patient records, and the attack has impacted 94% of hospitals nationwide. Despite their absence today, I think we have a great panel of witnesses that will help us begin to assess lessons learned from the change healthcare cyber attack so we can help prevent systems risks from future attacks, or I should say systematic risks from future attacks. And I, and I look forward to hearing uh, your perspectives on the effect of the cyber attack on our healthcare system, how the federal government can continue to work with the private sector to strengthen the cybersecurity across the health sector, and what additional action is needed to protect our healthcare system. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. That concludes opening statements. And so I'll go to wit witness statements. So each of you will have five minutes to summarize your written testimony. And then we have the light system. Those of you who haven't testified before, you have a green light for four minutes, you have a yellow light for a minute. Then when you see the red light, it's time to, to wrap up. So uh, we appreciate you being here. I'll introduce you all, then I'll go back and call on one at a time. So our witnesses today are Mr. Greg Garcia, Executive Director for Cybersecurity Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council. Mr. Robert Sheldon, a Senior Director of Public Policy and Strategy for CrowdStrike. Uh, Mr. John Riggi, National Advisor for Cybersecurity and Risk at the American Hospital Association. Uh, Mr. Scott McLean, Board Chair, College of Healthcare Information Management Executives, and Dr. Adam Brueggemann, uh, orthopedic surgeon for the Texas Spine Center. So I appreciate you all for being here. I know it took a lot of time and effort for you to be here. It's much appreciated. And I will now recognize Mr. Garcia for five minutes for your, Garcia, for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Guthrie, um, Ranking Member Eshoo, and members of the committee. My name is Greg Garcia. I'm the Executive Director of the Cybersecurity Working Group of the Health Sector Coordinating Council. We are an industry-led advisory council of more than 430 healthcare organizations um, and government agencies um, partnering to protect the health system from systemic cyber threats. The change healthcare attack is, of course, the most recent and certainly the most appalling and disruptive uh, to healthcare delivery that we've seen to date. My statement today will focus not on the technical or operational aspects of the change healthcare cyber attack. Uh, I'll leave that to others on this panel. I will offer what we believe the health sector and our government partners need to do to get ahead of future incidents uh, and reduce their likelihood and impact. So allow me to go right to our recommendations. Our first recommendation is, in fact, just now getting underway. It's the need to perform a health infrastructure mapping and risk assessment. This will provide visibility to those critical services and utilities, such as change healthcare, that support the many essential dependencies across the healthcare ecosystem. Pull up the floorboards and look at the plumbing. See where the joints are loose and where the leaks are. Second, the government should assess future consolidation proposals for mergers and acquisitions against their potential for increased cyber incident and impact risk. Third, hold third-party product and service providers and business associates to a higher standard of secure by design and secure by default for technology and services used in critical healthcare infrastructure. Fourth, enhance a government industry rapid response capability against systemic attacks. Emergency response, recovery, and business continuity remain ongoing challenges for our private sector and government stakeholders alike. What is envisioned is using government authority to, to declare national cyber emergencies, activate catastrophic national cyber insurance, provide fast financial support, permit temporary suspension of regulatory choke points, and provide mobile healthcare capability to assist those in dire need. 
This is called for in our health industry cybersecurity strategic plan, which I'll introduce in a moment. And this need is particularly important for the so-called target rich and cyber poor, the small, rural, critical access, federally qualified health centers, public health, and un other underserved, under-resourced health entities across the nation. Fifth, invest in a cyber safety net for those underserved providers, built on incentives and accountability. The nation's under-resourced health systems are the most vulnerable to cyber threats, lacking the funding and expertise to invest in basic cyber hygiene requirements, or to respond, recover, and return to business after a crippling event like Change Healthcare. The Sector Coordinating Council has published 27 freely available cyber best practices to close that gap between threats and preparedness. But the scarcity of funding and awareness continue to impede adoption and implementation. Now, the HHS 2025 budget request offers an incentive and accountability approach modeled after the Promoting Interoperability Program. It calls for an $800 million commitment over two years to certain high-need hospitals to implement baseline cyber performance goals. After that, if providers don't meet those minimum standards, penalties will apply. This is incentive followed by accountability, and we should see how that works. Finally, over the next five years, industry and government must implement the Health Industry Cybersecurity Strategic Plan that we published in February. The plan recommends 10 cybersecurity goals, 12 implementing objectives over the next five years to get us from critical condition to stable condition in healthcare cybersecurity. If we make progress against those goals and objectives, then healthcare cybersecurity will be made easier for patients and practitioners. Secure design and secure management of technology and services in the clinical environment is a shared responsibility. Leaders in the healthcare C-suite own cybersecurity as an element of enterprise risk and make it a part of organizational culture. A cyber safety net is in place to promote cyber equity, workforce is trained in good cybersecurity, and a 911 cyber civil defense to lead incident response and recovery is reflexive and always on. I will sum up. Members of the committee, the health industry must be sensitized to the imperative that cyber safety is patient safety. All healthcare stakeholders, that means providers, payers, medical technology, health IT, pharmaceuticals, public health, and of course government, are responsible for cyber safety so that our nation's clinicians can do their job. If together we achieve these goals, our cyber adversaries' attempts to victimize the business of saving lives will become too expensive and too risky. Thank you, members of the committee. That concludes my remarks, and I ask that our health industry cyber strategic plan be included in the record. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, we have that, I think, on our documents list. We appreciate your testimony. Mr. Sheldon, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Chairman Guthrie, Ranking Member Eshoo, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Every week, we see news of healthcare entities like doctor's offices, hospitals, pharmacies, insurance providers getting breached or disrupted by cyber threat actors. Each instance delays essential services. Ms. Sheldon, would you put your microphone closer or make sure it's on, Indeed. I guess? Thank you. Um, each instance delays essential services, adds costs, poses difficult privacy challenges, and introduces uncertainty into the care of patients. Some attacks against the sector have led to protracted, debilitating disruptions with national level consequences. Once only theorized, reports are increasing in recent years of real casualties from these attacks. While I'm unable to describe any particular breach, I'd like to share some observations and lessons from CrowdStrike's work protecting tens of thousands of customers globally, including many within the healthcare sector. Across these entities, we provide proactive defense through a variety of technical solutions, incident response services, and threat intelligence insights. Before providing, sorry, before proceeding further, I'd like to acknowledge and thank healthcare workers and caregivers. Most enter the field to treat people, not to become cybersecurity professionals. Yet, as we've seen, cybersecurity is absolutely critical to the provision of medical care today. Many within the field are rising to the challenge, and there's more that we can do as a community to help them. Healthcare is one of the most heavily targeted critical infrastructure sectors. Cyber threat actors attempt to breach these entities for a variety of reasons. E-crime actors seek to monetize hacking these entities through ransomware, data extortion, business email compromise, theft of medical records, and access to banking and payment information. Nation state actors target the sector seeking information about specific individuals or broad populations for espionage purposes 
and could leverage disruptive or destructive attacks to advance geopolitical aims. Recent CrowdStrike research highlights the implications of threat actors' heightened attention on the sector. According to our 2024 Global Threat Report, ransomware actors and data access brokers in particular target healthcare. They widely share sensitive data and records, including patient photos, on dedicated leak sites. And 8% of all interactive intrusions, that is those with a human at the keyboard, not just a bot or spam, last year impacted healthcare entities. Healthcare cybersecurity is premised on an absolute need for continuity of operations. Practitioners in the space are acutely aware of cyber risks. However, there is a radical disparity in cybersecurity readiness and outcomes between the haves and have-nots in the field. There are related but distinct challenges with respect to rural healthcare. Healthcare IT environments can be incredibly complex. As in other sectors, cloud infrastructure is increasingly common. Internet of Medical Things or IOMT devices extend the attack surface and may not support traditional security technologies. While some of these systems are cutting edge, legacy technologies also remain widely used. The healthcare business environment is also complex. Significant requirements exist for con connectivity, integration, and interoperability between providers, insurers, and other actors. Electronic medical records and virtual treatment options are widely used. A dynamic business environment means M&A activity is commonplace. Healthcare is also governed by a challenging regulatory landscape. Of note, HIPAA high tech has required security and breach reporting for more than a decade. CIRCEA requires reporting from entities whose disruption would impact public health and safety. The new SEC disclosure rule applies to publicly traded entities within the healthcare space. Regulations are advancing at the state level, and there are now voluntary sector-specific cybersecurity performance goals, or CPGs. I'd like to offer a few recommendations to improve healthcare cybersecurity outcomes. First, small and medium-sized entities in particular, including those with the resource constraints, should strongly consider leveraging a trusted managed security services provider, or MSSP. This type of partnership enables MSSPs to focus on security and healthcare providers to focus on healthcare. Resident security talent within user organizations also saves time and can focus on esoteric security challenges like those presented by testing and integrating that new IOMT solutions. Entities in the sector that already have sophisticated security programs should focus on the frontiers. These include leveraging AI for security-related tasks, implementing robust identity threat protection solutions, adopting a shared services architecture where appropriate to enforce security measures across federated or associated entities, and addressing concentration risk from over-reliance on one vendor across multiple parts of the enterprise IT environment. Policymakers should identify mechanisms to support the objectives identified above. One often overlooked opportunity is the use of tax mechanisms like credits to promote adoption of cybersecurity measures. These could target selected beneficiaries like small or rural providers. Policymakers should also double down on regulatory harmonization in light of increasing compliance requirements. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the full committee's efforts under Chairwoman Rogers and Ranking Member Pallone to pass federal privacy legislation, which has the potential to simplify breach reporting obligations. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Ricci, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Chair Guthrie, Ranking Member Hsu, Chair Rogers, Ranking Member Pallone, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is John Ricci, and I am the National Advisor for Cybersecurity and Risk at the American Hospital Association. Prior to joining the AHA, I served nearly 30 years at the FBI, including as a senior executive in the Bureau's Cyber Division. Caring for patients is the top priority for America's hospitals and health systems. Cyber attacks on the healthcare sector are attacks on patients. Any cyber attack that disrupts or delays patient care is a threat to life crime. Because of this, hospitals have invested billions of dollars to defend their networks from threats that can disrupt patient care. We know, however, that no organization is immune from cyber attacks. On February 21, Change Healthcare was the victim of the most significant cyber attack on the U.S. healthcare sector in history. Throughout the incident, AHA's primary focus has been to support hospitals so they could continue to provide patient care. But during the early days and weeks following the attack, it was very difficult to obtain clear information from Change and its corporate owner, United Health Group, and they appeared to minimize the impact of the attack. As a result, patients struggled to get timely access to care. An AHA survey conducted in March found that 74% of hospitals reported direct patient care impact, including delays in authorizations for medically necessary care. There was also significant financial impact. 
billions of dollars stopped flowing through the healthcare providers. This threat to solvency of our nation's provider network was a threat to patients because providers can't care for patients if they can't keep their doors open. It remains unclear how long it will take for all of chain's operations to return to normal. The wide Im widespread impact on the healthcare sector was not completely surprising. That's because Change Healthcare is the predominant source of more than 100 critical functions that keep the healthcare sector operating. The company processes 15 billion healthcare transactions annually and touches one in every three patient records. When United Health Group proposed its acquisition of Change Healthcare in 2021, the AHA wrote to the DOJ to express significant concerns about this potential concentration in the market. And during the investigation of the deal, DOJ uncovered internal change healthcare documents that stating, quote, the healthcare system and how payers and providers interact and transact would not work without change healthcare. The past two months have shown just that. As a result of the acquisition, change healthcare is now part of United Health Group, the number five company on the Fortune 500 list. United brought in more than $370 billion in revenue and $22 billion in profit in 2023. Despite their immense resources, United Health Group did not do enough for the healthcare providers to mitigate the financial impact of this attack. As AHA wrote to the company in early March, their initial financial assistance program was not even a Band-Aid on the problem. Many providers had no choice but to drain their cash reserves or take out private loans at high interest rates to continue providing care for patients. Meanwhile, the federal government did not step in for weeks. Needed flexibilities under Medicare were not immediately available. It took 18 days for CMS to begin allowing providers to apply for advanced and accelerated payments. To be clear, hospitals and health systems kept providing care. Even as no money was coming in the door, patients were. It is critical that Congress provide additional authority for advanced and accelerated payments that would allow CMS to be more responsive to the needs of providers during future emergencies. It is also important to note that hospitals are not the primary source of cyber risk facing the healthcare sector. A review of the largest healthcare data breaches in 2023 shows that over 95% were related to business associates and other non-hospital healthcare entities. The AHA strongly supports voluntary cybersecurity performance goals, such as those announced in January by HHS. In fact, the AHA helped lead the development of those practices. But to make meaningful progress in the war on cybercrime, Congress and the administration should focus on the entire healthcare sector, not just hospitals. And we must not lose sight of the root cause of most cyber attacks, foreign hackers protected by hostile nation states. The AHA stands ready to work with Congress and all stakeholders to fight cybercrime and the devastating impacts it can have on the healthcare sector and our patients. If this attack has taught us anything, it is this. What we need is a whole of nation approach to protect patients, providers in America from these devastating cyber attacks. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The chair will now recognize. Do you go by McLean or McLean? McLean. Thanks. So we say it in Kentucky. I have McLean County in my district. So, yeah, thank you. So, Mr. McLean, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, uh, Chairman Guthrie, Vice Chair Bouchon, Ranking Member Eshu, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Scott McLean. I'm the board chair for the College of Healthcare Information Management Executives, or CHIME, and also the senior vice president and chief information officer for MedStar Health here in the Washington, D.C. region. I'm grateful for the opportunity to represent CHIME's membership here in today's hearing. CHIME is an executive organization dedicating to serving CIOs and other senior healthcare IT leaders in diverse healthcare provider settings nationwide. Our members are among the nation's foremost health IT experts and are doing their best to navigate an increasingly risky cybersecurity landscape, a job that has become drastically complicated. CHIME's members represent provider organizations of varying sizes across the nation including large not-for-profit hospital systems, community hospitals, for-profit hospitals, small and rural hospitals, long-term care facilities, and critical access hospitals. As we've discussed, on February 21st of this year, Change Healthcare discovered that a threat actor gained access to one of their environments. This is the largest cyber attack on our sector to date. 
much larger than the WannaCry event experienced several years ago. It has and continues to interrupt patient care, and the financial impact on our members has been significant. The scale and repercussions of this cyber attack cannot be underestimated. Following the attack, there was a dearth of information, and our members found themselves navigating in the dark, unsure where to turn for help. While we continue to work towards interoperability, this incident has demonstrated our vulnerability to cyber attacks. We must continue to move away from a mentality that punishes those who have been victimized by malicious actors and criminals. Cybersecurity is a shared responsibility. However, without additional federal assistance, the healthcare and public health sector is limited in what we can do. In preparation for this hearing, Chime conducted a survey of some of our members to better understand the ongoing significance of this attack. These results are unnerving, and additional findings are in our written testimony. In assessing the impact of the change cyber incident on patient care, 40% reported patient care was somewhat impacted, 25% said moderately impacted, 15 significantly impacted, 5% extremely, and only 13% claimed no impact to patient care. When asked about other consequences, our survey found that 85% experienced detrimental influences on their claims, 81% suffered attacks and uh, setbacks and reimbursement, 75% grappled with disruptions to their revenue cycle, and 71% encountered issues with claim submission. Given the outsized toll this cyber event has taken on our hospitals and healthcare systems, we respectfully submit the following three main areas of focus for consideration by the subcommittee. First, Prioritization of cybersecurity and greater support for our sector is needed. CHIME supports minimum standards for cybersecurity best practices, co coupled with incentive-based federal funding. A federally sponsored catastrophic cyber insurance program is needed to help healthcare providers offset the extremely high cost of coverage. Incentives for education and training programs are needed to shore up our workforce in this area. And, an all-hazards designation is needed to facilitate access to more federal resources when major incidents like the change healthcare cyber attack occur. Second, cybersecurity must be a shared responsibility and not all organizations are equally able to respond to such an incident. Importantly, managing third-party risk must be a shared responsibility. The number of technological factors and undiscovered vulnerabilities outside of a provider's control is significant. It is an enormous challenge for our sector and it cannot be solved by imposing costly mandates on providers. We understand providers must do their part. If we were to move the small and underserved resources forward, funding for them must be prioritized. With the healthcare sector only as strong as its weakest link, it is imperative that the federal government prioritize programs dedicated to aid small and under-resourced hospitals and healthcare systems, including long-term post-acute care providers who never received the high-tech funding as incentive for EHR adoption. Third, greater transparency is needed when an organization experiences a cyber incident. Safe harbors to foster information sharing should be established. Victimized organizations are fearful that by sharing details, it will open them up to regulatory and liability risks. Enacting safe harbors for information sharing will benefit our sector. Our sector also needs a federally driven playbook. We need to know who to call during a cyber incident, and we must have a clear pathway to the federal front door at HHS. In conclusion, I thank the subcommittee for the opportunity to share our experience and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, I appreciate your testimony. Dr. Brueggemann, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Guthrie, Ranking Member Eshoo, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on this critical topic in our healthcare system. My name is Dr. Adam Brueggemann, and I am a board-certified orthopedic spine surgeon from San Antonio, Texas. I am here to share my firsthand experience with the Change Healthcare cyber attack and the impact it has had on physician practices beginning in February of 2024. Change Healthcare serves as a clearinghouse that processes and submits medical claims to insurers on behalf of healthcare providers. When the healthcare cyber attack occurred and caused Change Healthcare to shut down, it affected all practices' ability to send claims early in the life cycle and forced physicians to hold claims until alternative options were established. Even though we have restored access to many insurers, my practice still must spend time manually recording each deposit into our bank account with individual insurer websites. And after all of this, insurers are in some cases still rejecting claims due to a lack of timely filing. The change outage was disruptive to the business of my practice, but most importantly, it was disruptive to my patients. 
Some received bills erroneously, and my support staff had to spend countless hours trying to figure out which patients owed money, which did not. Every minute my staff spends trying to reconcile ERAs with received payments, assessing which patients received incorrect bills, resubmitting prior authorizations, is time taken away from patient care. The attack has exposed the vulnerabilities in our healthcare system and the disproportionate burden placed on physician practices by insurers, government payers, and third-party vendors. As we move forward from this attack, a significant focus will be placed on cybersecurity and data protection, and rightly so. As physicians, we must be able to sit in the room with a patient, document what is happening with their health, and trust that our documentation is safe and secure. With the desire to continue shifting from fee-for-service arrangements to value-based care, the amount of patient information that physicians will have to track to share among different practices will only increase, leaving patient information even more exposed than it is today. The average physician practice has only a few weeks to a month's worth of cash on hand in their practice. Insurers like United Health Group have plenty of data to understand the usual charges from and payments to a practice in a typical week. There is little to no reason why insurers could not have continued to make weekly payments based on the physician's unique history, then reconciled once the clearinghouse outage was resolved. Recall that insurers are paid premiums in advance of care and have the money on hand. My concern that cyber threats will drive further consolidation is not just hypothetical. We are seeing this play out as a direct result of the February attack. For practices whose cash flow was completely cut off and whose cash reserves were spent dry, the financial relief offered by CMS and Optum, the parent company of Change Healthcare, and a subsidiary of United Health Group was slow to arrive, it was complicated, and it was insufficient. To add insult to injury, some of these practices were purchased by Optum during the crisis. There were even reports of Optum using the financial emergency caused by the cyber attack on its own subsidiary as legal justification to expedite its acquisition of physician practices. I find it hard to believe that Optum could not have found other ways to support those practices rather than buying them at a discount and further consolidating that market. For its part, Congress should clarify the agency's authority to respond to future disruptions so that impacted parties do not lose precious time waiting for guidance. Congress should seize this opportunity presented by the recent cybersecurity incident to thoroughly examine whether the growing consolidation within a U.S. healthcare market truly serves the best interests of patient care. Allowing physicians to practice in the setting that is best for them, their patients, and their broader community should be the hallmark of our United States healthcare system. Instead, the increase in administrative burden, including the new threats of potential cyber attacks, makes such events catastrophic for far too many providers. I urge the committee to act and work towards solutions that ensure the stability and security of our healthcare infrastructure. Thank you for your, your attention on this critical matter. Thank you, I appreciate your testimony. That concludes all witness testimony. We'll now move into the questioning period where each member will have five minutes to ask questions. And I'll begin by recognizing myself for five minutes to uh, begin the questioning. So first, Mr. Rigi, um, we need to appropriately address the cyber vulnerabilities. I know the Biden administration has put out a plan to, to bolster uh, our, our ability to detect. So how can we appropriately address cyber vulnerabilities with the hospital systems without forcing these systems to spend, to spend significant resources on complying with HHS mandates? Thank you, Chair. I think part of the solution starts outside the hospital. First, it starts with ensuring that the technology we employ in our hospitals is secure by design and secure by default, as the White House has uh, promoted this initiative, which the AHA strongly supports. After all, hospitals do not write our own operating system code. We don't build our own medical devices. We buy them from third parties. So starting with better secured technology, I think is fundamental. And then ensuring that the third parties we deal with, such as United Health Group, employ cybersecurity best practices themselves. So securing our entire ecosystem. And then once it focused on the hospitals, we then begin to approach this in a layered defensive measure, employing all those voluntary cybersecurity performance goals that were published in January. And then, but ultimately understanding that no organization will be immune and ensuring we have redundancy and resiliency for our mission critical and life critical services. Okay, another question for you, Mr. Ritchie. I know uh, there's a 2024 GAO report about the number of cyber attacks, and we know for sure 
that one was perpetrated by North Korea state sponsorship. What are the vulnerabilities? And if anybody else would like to ask it, but Mr. Rigi, uh, we know that we have dark web people doing this. What is the comparison between the dark web versus state sponsored terrorism? So generally the hackers do fall on those two type of groups, criminal, rogue actors, and nation state supported actors. Certainly those that are supported or sponsored by nation states can be far more dangerous because they have the access to the entire uh, intelligence apparatus and resources of a nation state. So they could be significantly more dangerous, specifically those associated with Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. The dark webs are looking for paydays. Is that, and then these others are trying to make us, our system vulnerable, correct? correct? Anybody else want to comment on that has some experience with the, the dark web versus the nation state? Is anybody? Fine, we can go to the next question there. You know, Mr. Yeah, Sheldon? I can, uh, I can jump in briefly. So yeah, it is the case that there's a huge part of the ecosystem that is there to monetize hacking. And you see the dark web as a place where threat actors can coordinate to do that. And <coughs> There's a lot of organization in these, um, you know, in these communities at this point where people do different elements of a breach and different aspects of monetization of a breach. For nation state actors, very frequently they will work independently um, and they will work to advance geopolitical aims. This is where we see uh, espionage, this is where we see destructive attacks. Um, it is the case with North Korea that they also uh, work on currency generation because of how they tend to fund their defense and military institutions, that uh, you see them engaging what looks outwardly like criminal activity, but it's actually associated with the state. So that's one, that one's a little bit unique among nation state actors. Thank you, appreciate that. So Mr. Garcia, uh, the Biden administration has released a national cybersecurity strategy last year and recently stated that HHS would issue voluntary healthcare and public health sector cybersecurity goals. So the, my question is, why are we just now focusing on this issue? And could these performance goals and greater information sharing with private sector partners, which the administration wants to do, have avoided this change attack? And what lessons can be learned from industries on how better to protect? Yes, good, good question, Mr. Chairman. Um, we are not just getting started with this issue. And in fact, um, there was a, um, a joint HHS Health Sector Council best practice first published in early 2019 uh, called the Health Industry Cybersecurity Practices, or HICCUP. You can say HICCUP. Um, it, it prescribes 10 major best practices, particularly for health providers, that all health pri providers need to do. And it started out as, and it remains, a voluntary best practice. Now HHS is, is taking pieces of that and proposing um, cyber performance goals, minimum controls. So I'm out of time. So would it be interesting, were the 10 best practices in place that change, or were there some vulnerability within those 10 that you Good see? question. I, I don't have visibility into their, into their okay. cyber risk management programs. Uh, um, but more and more, we are seeing uptake and implementation of the HICCUP um, cyber, uh, cyber performance controls. And HHS now is proposing in its budget to make some of those actually mandatory on health providers. Thanks. Thank you. My time has expired. I'll recognize the ranking member for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to each one of you, uh, our witnesses today. I think your statements, both written and oral, uh, have been uh, highly uh, instructive. Uh, Mr. Rigi, uh, you stated that hospitals and health systems have invested billions of dollars uh, to protect patient data and defend their networks against um, cyber attacks. If all this money was invested uh, to bolster their infrastructure, how is it that these healthcare organizations um, are still so clearly uh, vulnerable to cyber attacks? Uh, you also argue that um, the federal government should be responsible for protecting hospitals against uh, these attacks. How much would that cost the federal government? I'm sure you've, uh, you have some penciling out of that. And um, uh, explain to um, the committee members why that should be uh, the federal government's responsibility. <coughs> Thank you for your question. Yes, the hospitals do, in fact, spend billions of dollars to protect their networks. But as we have increased our digital health care utilization of network and internet connected technology, ultimately to improve patient outcomes and save lives, that has resulted in an expanded digital attack surface 
And often the Why is there a nexus between the two? Uh, as we expand the technology that we're using is often has technical vulnerabilities in it that come to us from our third party technology providers, which our adversaries are constantly scanning the technology to identify these vulnerabilities and develop malware to attack our networks. And what about the money? In, in terms of the government's money? Mm. Yes, it would probably require, I'm sure, significant expenditure from the government, but ultimately, these hackers are based overseas, sheltered by hostile nation states, which absolutely pro, uh, pose a risk to national security and broad public health and safety. Do you think what the president has placed in his budget uh, suffices? In terms of the CPGs, the 1.3 billion, we believe at this point that is far from sufficient. Act woefully sufficient, given the 6,000 hospitals yeah. that would have to utilize that money. Uh, Mr. Sheldon, you work with uh, large entities in the uh, healthcare uh, sector to improve their uh, cybersecurity um, uh, practices. Um, were United Health cybersecurity standards adequate to protect sensitive patient information, in your view? And um, if United Healthcare were your client, um, what would your recommendations be to them? Thank you for the question. Unfortunately, I can't address a particular breach. I can say, though, that some of the best practices that we see used by people in this sector and other sectors um, are the usage of a managed security services provider. That's a very uh, common thing at this point that helps organizations um, manage threats that are general, that target the enterprise, so that people who work on specific, uh, specific threats to the sector can can apply that insight and energy about business process, about esoteric endpoints like medical devices and things mm -hmm. like that, and really work on risk management plans to, to focus on that problem set. So that's a good one. Yep. I don't know whether you can uh, answer this or not, but it, uh, there are two things about uh, cybersecurity. One is the investment of a system. And um, I don't know how much confidence I have in, uh, in, in hospitals buying the right thing, number one. Um, but the other is, is that whatever system you set up, uh, you have to keep it up. It's not just installing a system and that you can waltz off with all the confidence in the world uh, that you're covered. Uh, do you have any sense of what those two are across the country? Thank you. Um, one thing that we say in the security community all the time is that Security is a process, it's not a destination. Mm. And we really emphasize that point because it's not the case that you can just pay for security one time and then set the problem aside. Mm -hmm. It's something that you really have to have a mature program that assesses mm -hmm. constantly different changes in light of different threat activity and different technology changes. Mm -hmm. So Thank you. that's the most important thing is right. to keep focused on it at a high level. Mr. Garcia, welcome. Mr. Garcia is my constituent. He's a graduate of Palo Alto High School, so it's uh, it's great to see you. It's always a source of pride uh, to a member when one of their constituents is testifying. So go Vikings! Y yes, yes, yes. Um, do you think that the uh, president's uh, budget proposal is sufficient? Uh, I agree with Mr. Rigi that it's going to need a lot more than that. Um, but I think it's a good place to start to see where um, we find the match between an appropriate amount of funding, particularly for the small underserved providers, and minimum accountability requirements, that they have to go hand in hand. Well, my time has expired. I want to thank each one of you, um, as I said, uh, uh, both your written your oral testimonies are helpful to us. Thank you. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. The chair recognizes the chair. Chair Rogers for five minutes for questions. Mr. Garcia, the Government Accountability Office has a number of recommendations for HHS on how to better coordinate and collaborate. Some of those recommendations are still open. Do you see a clear lead on cybersecurity within HHS? and has coordination and collaboration within the department and with industry improved over time? Uh, very good question. Uh, the answer to your second question is yes, it is improving. Um, when we organized the Cyber Working Group back in 2017, I will say the agency was not well organized to prioritize cybersecurity nor 
to coordinate all of those operational divisions that you, uh, uh, that you mentioned um, in your opening statement. Um, I think ASPR, um, through the direction of uh, the, the Secretary's office, the Deputy Secretary's office, has done a lot over the past couple of years to get that level of coordination. The challenge, of course, is you have so many operational uh, divisions that, have, that answer to different statutory authorities. And cybersecurity has not traditionally been a part of their statutory authority other than OCR having its breach, HIPAA, HIPAA breach uh, enforcement authority. So it's, it, it is hurting a lot of cats, um, but we are seeing over the past couple of years a much more uh, coherent and forward-leaning approach by HHS to partner with us because we're not slowing ourselves, we're not slowing down on the industry side. Mm -hmm. Do you see a clear lead? Asper. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sheldon, as part of your work to respond to cyber threats across all different industries and sectors, are there lessons other s sectors such as financial services have learned that need to be applied to healthcare? And in your view, has adoption of prevention measures been driven more by incentives or by threat and penalties? Thank you. Some of the key practices that we see in, across major sectors that help drive down cybersecurity attacks are use of managed security services, use of zero trust architectures, use of next generation SIEM, endpoint detection and response, and I could list a number of other types of technologies. The entities and sectors that are best situated to defeat threats have mature security programs that assess these technologies that they develop because they do develop over time and implement ones that will work for them. So it's a challenging process, but having cybersecurity performance goals that are based on the sector help people really focus on the things that are gonna have high leverage for that sector specifically, including for problems that are specific to that sector. Okay, thank you. Mr. McLean, in your testimony, you highlight the recommendation by the Health Sector Coordinating Council that certain high impact cyber and ransomware attacks should be designated as all hazards incidences such as to activate a FEMA response and related support services. Can you share the rationale as to why the recommendation was specific to a FEMA designation as opposed to a public health emergency or relevant state emergency declaration? Thank you, Chair Rogers. Uh, we talked about this, and I think FEMA is an example of one way the federal government could help respond. Um, we, we did not feel that it would be the recommendation for a public health emergency and unless the incident carried on to impact uh, public health by providers not being available for a long period of time. We do feel like there is a need for, uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, an immediate response, a place where we can broker information safely and securely, have discussions with all the parties that are available and support from the various governmental agencies. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Garcia, would you also comment on that question? Yes, absolutely. Um, the, the all hazards piece mm -hmm. is is a part of it. That we know that there are many instances where there are blended threats. There is a a, a severe weather event mm -hmm. that goes through a region at the same time that a cyber attack is impacting um, various organizations. So, what is the government's emergency response capability? Um, you know, FEMA and the Stafford Act, being able to declare a national emergency is one example. Uh, the hospital preparedness program is, is another one, which is specifically for severe weather events and other catastrophes like that. But we need to be thinking proactively about how cybersecurity is a risk management imperative, the same way that physical security is. And however we architect a government response program, that needs to be part of that calculus. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate your insights. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, the chair yields back, and the chair recognizes a ranking member for five minutes for questions. Ranking member Pallone is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mentioned briefly in my opening the difficulty my constituent had in accessing his prescription test strips in the aftermath of the cyber attack. But let me ask um, Dr. Wiggum and, and then Mr. Uh, Riggi, can you each briefly describe other disruptions to patient care as a result of the cyber attack on change healthcare? Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Brueggemann. Sure. 
you know, I think the biggest issue for our patients has been the financial uncertainty, receiving bills that they are not clear. Part of the process that Change Healthcare provides for us is a communication as to why they deposited money in our bank account. But we don't get that communication anymore. We simply get a deposit. And it's we are unable to balance our checkbooks. And as a result of that, patients receive bills that state that they owe their full and owed amount. And then they call and are frustrated and concerned. And that is not really what we want to be. We want to have a good relationship with our patients, and that disrupts that relationship, and that has significantly disrupted patient care. Thank you. Mr. Ritchie? Thank you. Uh, initially, we did receive reports that there were disruptions to patient care in the form of simply verifying they had insurance or pre-authorizations for elective surgeries. And prescriptions, we understand, were significantly disrupted, at least in the initial phases, including at the military's TRICARE pharmacies. So those prescriptions, the pre-authorizations, insurance verifications certainly caused some delay and disruption for a number of weeks, at least initially. And w just tell me or explain why the attack on Change Healthcare resulted in such nationwide impacts, if you will. Clearly, Change Healthcare, the, the consolidation of Change, United, and Optum created this consolidation of mission-critical services. And ultimately, that created a consolidation of risk that the entire healthcare sector was exposed to. Even in the early days, uh, days, it was unclear at how so many interconnections existed between change and clearinghouses. So hospitals may have had a relationship with one entity, believing they were not connected to Change United, only to find that entity used change as their clearinghouse. So that consolidation of services and our interconnectivity resulted in this widespread impact. Well, this, can, I'd like to understand a little more about the implications of a consolidation for patients, right? So in this case, the disruption in patient care that resulted from the cyber attack raises a lot of questions about the heightened risk posed by consolidation of health technology services within a single company. Uh, but in, in addition to better understanding how consolidation uh, technology vendors is affecting this, the healthcare sector, we also have to ensure that providers have the cybersecurity protections in place to address attacks that, that target them directly. So let me go to Mr. McLean. How can Congress help providers reduce their cybersecurity risks and vulnerabilities, if you will? Sure, thank you, uh, Ranking Member. As Mr. Uh, Ridgey pointed out in his testimony there, we do, our providers spend a significant amount of money every year to uh, protect ourselves. And there are very good frameworks there, uh, NIST and the CPGs aforementioned. And there, we invest in technical controls like firewalls and antivirus software, physical controls, locking up data centers and data closets, administrative controls like policies and behavioral controls. Um, like uh, fish tests on our associates. So um, it is a uh, situation where um, the federal government can help us because I, I believe uh, the latest numbers about uh, healthcare margins, we've seen healthcare providers coming out of the pandemic with still very limited margins and so limited ability to invest. So I think a public-private partnership similar to the High Tech Act with incentive funding to be able to help us make larger investments in these areas to grow out um, our defenses. I think if you go to any cybersecurity conference, you're going to hear that it's not if you get hit, it's when you get hit. And so we're also focused on response and preparedness. We've talked about that some here, communication, making sure that data are backed up and uh, available to be able to be restored in, in such an event. And, and I think we've got an opportunity to work together, uh, again, under an incentive-based program like the High Tech Act, to be able to help particularly, we talk about small providers, and when we talk about small, we mean not just small, but also under-resourced, whether it's a small practice or if it's a uh, community hospital or a critical access hospital that doesn't have the same resources as a large provider. This is an area where we really uh, need to invest, particularly in the care continuum, the long-term uh, post-acute hospital uh, facilities that didn't get funding during high tech. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back, and the chair recognizes the chair of the Rules Committee, Chair Burgess, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, <clears throat> I was here when we did the High Tech Act. I'm sorry, I don't see that as a solution. That actually was 
the genesis of a lot of the problems that we now face today in, in consolidation. And Mr. Pallone, I'm happy to help you with a discussion on consolidation. I have some ideas. Physician ownership of hospitals is one that I think would reverse the trend of consolidation. And maybe, maybe this committee can work on that uh, during the time that I have left. I, I am grateful that the chair mentioned the, the Patch Act uh, that uh, was introduced prior to the last FDA reauthorization. And the concept was that we would require medical device manufacturers to have cybersecurity plans and protocols prior to the pre-market approval through the FDA. Um, I, that was included in the last FDA reauthorization. I think it's important and I think clearly with what's happened with Change Healthcare, that is something that, uh, that we need to build on. Dr. Bruggeman, thank you for being here today. I know it's a sacrifice for you to take time away from your practice. I know your practice has been through a lot, as, as every practice has in the last several months. One of the things that concerns me so much about all of this is everything that we talk about seems geared toward blaming the victim. I mean, you are the victim in this. This is not your fault. You did not leave the data out on the sidewalk for someone to drift by and, and pick it up like it was an abandoned wallet. You were attacked. The government should be helping you with that. Change Healthcare should be helping you with that. Can you speak a little bit to, you? I think alluded to the fact that insurance payments are made in advance of a service being rendered. Was there any effort on the part of Change Healthcare to look at what your historical payments had been and prepay you some of those, some some of that financial, what what you would have billed to, to to make you whole and keep you afloat during this? Yeah, I, I, they they did set up a fund to help uh, practices get through this cash crunch period. However, uh, you know all of the insurance carriers go through Change Healthcare, and while they had visibility into perhaps United Healthcare's payments, they did not have visibility into Blue Cross, say, or Aetna or Cigna. And so there was an inability for them to provide the right amount of money. There are stories online about practices receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars less than what their actual cost was to run their practice and what they were billing. And so I, I think the answer is yes, they provided information. However, the information was incomplete due to the fragmentation of the way that we bill for healthcare. Well, let me ask you this. Is there a way prospectively now going forward that we could look at that Look, we know there's going to be additional hurricanes in the country, and at some point there will be a time when your accounts receivable maybe ends up in the Gulf of Mexico again, and, and you can't collect. So that's predictable that problems are going to happen. What about if we tried to predict this type of problem happening and how we can lessen the impact on you, the victim, in this case? Yeah, I think we absolutely need to study how we can track that information, track that data. Should some sort of similar cybersecurity event, as was discussed, one of these is going to happen again. How do we protect physicians in the future? How do we protect small rural hospitals in the future? Those are the things that we're going to have to really look at because those are the most vulnerable parts of our healthcare system. Right, and unlike a hurricane, I mean, you were still seeing patients. You were still in the operating room all of the time this was occurring. So new charges are being generated consistently. It's not like there was a hurricane that shut everything down and you stopped seeing patients for a month. You were still in the income or the, uh, the, the gen income generating side of your business. Again, it just, it just astounds me that we could find you in and leave you so vulnerable in this when it's quite predictable that your, your AR is going to go down or your AR is going to go up, your accounts, for, your, your accounts paid is going to go down because of not something you did, not because of a weather event, but because of something that happened at Change Healthcare. And then just a broader question for everyone on the panel, what are we doing to proactively look at, I mean, okay, Change Healthcare, United Healthcare, Optum got massive. Are they under any obligation as such a large per, uh, payer in the ecosystem, <clears throat> are they under any obligation to periodically assess how vulnerable they are? Not leave it all on Dr. Bergerman. I mean, he's, he's got his hands full with what he's doing taking care of patients. But what about on change in United and Optum that they continually test their systems and report back to Dr. Bergerman if, hey, we've identified a problem that could put you at risk? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Yes, sir. Uh, 
I, I do, and, and I think um, being able to understand your, and to be able to assess your third party technology and service providers is a key element of cyber risk. You need to know what you're buying and who you're letting into your network. And that is, that is a basic cybersecurity control. And while I agree with Mr. Rigi that, that a lot of third party technology um, is, is presenting vulnerabilities, um, health systems also have responsibility. Yes, they are the victim, uh, but if we live in a bad neighborhood, we don't leave our doors unlocked and our windows open, and the internet is a bad neighborhood. So there are some basic responsibilities. A lot of the ways that hospitals are getting beat um, are some of the most simple cyber hygiene uh, controls that, that many of them uh, either cannot because of resources or prioritize other things to do instead of investing in some of those basic Thanks. basic controls that will protect them from being a victim. Yeah, my time's expired, but I promise you, if hospitals are, are financially constrained, individual doctor's offices Absolutely. are much more so. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Chairman. Yields back, and the chair now recognizes Mr. Sarbanes for five minutes for questions. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to all of you. This change healthcare attack is the most recent and most catastrophic, from what we can tell, example of cyber attack on a third party entity resulting in disruptions across our healthcare system. Most of, most of us, if not all of us, have now heard from providers big and small in our districts who are impacted by the incident. As it is estimated, as you know, the Change Healthcare platform touches one in three patient records in the United States. Uh, that's kind of mind boggling when you think about it. Despite that, we've heard concerns about how, how cybersecurity liability is being shared, or rather is not actually being shared in any kind of reasonable or fair way among healthcare providers and their business associates and vendors like um, Change Healthcare. Uh, Mr. McLean or Dr. Brueggemann, um, can you briefly comment on how these cybersecurity responsibilities are shared, what that looks like? Why don't we start with you, Mr. McLean? Sure. So um, we've talked about in our testimony a large number of third parties that we contract with, our members contract with for, for services. And most of our providers have regular processes where uh, we do security reviews and also the HIPAA business associates agreement. And uh, as you know, the, uh, these suppliers um, aren't always folks that are covered in the same way that we are under the federal regulations. And so uh, we do our best to uh, set up the, the best security controls for these um, suppliers that we have, um, but we, we need more collective responsibility across those who are stewarding healthcare data to work together for security. Dr. Brueggemann, why don't you give me your thoughts as a provider? Have you had any success in negotiating shared cybersecurity liability with business associates, other vendors, and so forth? Yeah, it may, it may be alarming to many on the panel and in this committee to know that um, most, most of these software programs limit their liability and dramatically. Um, my liability with most of our, in, of our electronic medical records is $10,000 or less, meaning that if there was a breach, they would pay up to three months worth of our software fees against the breach and the cost of rectifying the breach and the people on this panel could probably tell you that number for my practice has the potential to run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to recover that I would be responsible for even though it was not my breach. I'm looking at a limitation of liability clause which is I think probably fairly typical when you're talking about a large vendor. It's essentially a contract of adhesion in, in these situations where one party has way more bargaining um, power than the other party. Um, and you're on, the, you're on the, the, the downside of that, the receiving end of that unfair um, liability distribution. But yeah, it's, it's limiting it in the ways that you just said, which really is outrageous when you think about what just happened, how much power and impact and influence is being consolidated um, in one 
vendor um, and then the cascading impact it has on the provider uh, community. One of, we, one of the goals of President Biden's national cybersecurity strategy is to rebalance this responsibility for cybersecurity, shift the burden away from individuals and smaller businesses and towards those who are better positioned to reduce risks across the board. Um, Dr. Brueggemann, what should Congress do in your view to ensure cybersecurity responsibilities are adequately shared by all the entities who touch patient data within the US healthcare system? Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I would certainly love to see some way of limiting or restricting the amount of um, liability rest restrictions that, the, that are listed within these contracts. And as physicians, we have no way of negotiating with companies that say touch one third of every single healthcare dollar in the United States. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, cybersecurity should be a meaningfully shared responsibility. Of course, that, you know, that's not how we operate, right? I mean, people are always looking at a way to offload their um, liability and protect the bottom line and so forth. But when you're, if, fair enough, if you're, you know, small, medium-sized player in a large um, ecosystem, but when you've got the kind of heft that we see here, um, there's got to be a better allocation of, of responsibility and, and liability uh, here. So with that, Mr. Chairman, yield back. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Dr. Bouchon for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate the opportunity today to learn more about the Change Healthcare incident and how Congress should address the aftermath. Uh, Look, Congress, I, I think, and the FTC is going to need to look at healthcare sector consolidation and integration. It's just another, another thing that's happened. With the massive vertical integration in our system, I believe, personally, is not in the best interest of the American people. Uh, Dr. Bregman, you operate a practice affected by the attack. Has United Health Group or Change Healthcare given any indication? of the extent to which patients' data was breached and what personal health information was compromised? Uh, we have not been given any information as it, re as it relates to that. Uh, I think the first time that we've even learned about what potentially was lost was uh, yesterday or this morning when the news reports came out that some, uh, some of the data has been leaked out onto the dark web with screenshots. So you don't even know, really know how to advise your patients uh, of what their what their exposure is at all. You didn't have that information. I have no idea. Okay. Uh, I want to reiterate how dire the circumstances have become for smaller practices and clinics. I, I think uh, the federal government as well as the private sector reacted pretty slowly um, in dealing with the consequences of the attack. I've heard from a small clinic in my district that the process is process just a few million dollars in claims through the change healthcare annually. Since the attack took place, the clinic has been filing the claims manually. It takes substantially longer, as you might imagine. It requires a clinic to pay for a lot more staff hours, including overtime pay and pay for postage, et cetera, to, for these claims. But it's essentially their only choice because changing clearinghouses, according to them, could void their cyber liability insurance policy. So the clinic, at this point, is hemorrhaging money. According to the clinic, again, this is according to them, the provider assistance option from United uh, is, in quotations, terrifying. They fear it provides unfettered access to bank account information and an agreement that United can simply change terms and conditions merely by providing notice. That sounds like, to me, potentially leveraging a buyout of their clinic. And that's just that's my opinion. And we've heard this from across the country. My understanding is it would be helpful for these small clinics if the timely filing deadline were suspended or at least extended from typical 90 days. And I've, I've already heard that uh, claims are being denied because of this. Dr. Bergman, do you think that a change to the current timely filing deadlines, at least in the short term, and potentially the long term, could be helpful? There has to be. If you think about it, some of these clinics may not have submitted bills for, say, a month or two months, and then the change healthcare outage occurred, and now we're two months in. They will be beyond the timely filing requirements when it goes back up, and it's not their fault. That may have been their process for when they submitted, and so we absolutely need to extend that deadline. Yeah, I would agree with that. Mr. Garcia, uh, complaints against Change Healthcare allege that, allege that it failed to enact adequate security protections ahead of the ransomware attack. Uh, industry stakeholders point to the vulnerability created by merging of United Health 
care group and change even following the DOJ's attempt to block the merger in 2022, resulting in a lack of options in the market for providers to transact claims. Uh, what steps should be taken to alleviate these concerns moving forward? Uh, very good question, sir. The, uh, one of our recommendations is, is just that, that in any future um, considerations of mergers and acquisitions um, in the healthcare sector, that uh, among the various um, antitrust considerations, such as market concentration and, and competition, uh, implications that uh, the potential for there becoming a single point of failure of either low redundancy or no redundancy that could cause a catastrophic cyber attack. If that finding is positive, then that should be very seriously taken into consideration as to whether to approve um, a merger uh, or some kind of consolidation that could increase cyber risk. So uh, maybe I probably should know this, but why did the DOJ wasn't successful, the federal government wasn't successful in proving legally that this should, merger shouldn't happen? Do you know? Why yeah, they, were, they tried to block the acquisition, I guess. Yeah, I didn't follow it closely. There, there was a court ruling that overturned the, the, the Justice Department. Yeah, okay. Finding. I get that. Um, okay, I was a surgeon before, so I get it. And, we, and uh, when the government reacts... Slowly, also, I just I'll just say this that you know, healthcare information is some of the most valuable information in the world. Very monetizable, as we've heard. We have got to do a better job here, folks. And I do think that vertical integration in our healthcare system, supposed to save money, is actually going the other direction. And we're going to have to take a strong look at this. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair will now recognize Mr. Cardenas from California for five minutes for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Guthrie, and also Ranking Member Eshu, for having this important hearing about cybersecurity breaches on our healthcare systems. Um, I'd also like to thank all of the witnesses uh, for sharing your expertise and opinions with us today. Uh, the FBI reported nearly 250 ransomware attacks against healthcare and public health entities in 2023, making the industry the top target for critical infrastructure attacks in the U.S. Um, Patients, in turn, trust healthcare providers and their affiliates to, uh, to make sure that they are not subject to breaches. And large and small, uh, if these breaches are successful, it's going to erode the trust of the people that they serve. Today, we're discussing a breach on an entity that is estimated to handle 15 billion clinical, financial, and operational transactions interacting with one in three patient records on the entire country, patients across the entire country. In my district, local hospitals shared that following the change healthcare, the change healthcare attack, their ability to collect payments from insurance companies dropped to zero, with backlogs of millions in payments as a result. When disruptions to a single entity can disrupt the entire healthcare ecosystem, it's time to help secure managing our healthcare infrastructure. My primary concern is taking action that addresses the immediate need of communities that have experienced issues such as delays in care or complications to receiving their prescription medications, et cetera, which leads to many other questions. My first question is to Mr. Sheldon. What mechanisms are currently available to bolster health system cybersecurity, safeguard patient safety, and ensure access to care? Thank you. Uh, all entities... All enterprises, really, whether they're at the point of patient care or whether they work on payments or any other part of the space, should uh, take uh, exceptional attention or pay exceptional attention to securing their own enterprises, and especially for ones that have medical devices or other connected devices that support the provision of care, then extra special attention needs to be paid for that because that is not especially common. There's obviously a lot of incentives in play in terms of how we can facilitate greater uptake in some of the technologies that I described earlier that help provide for that high level of security, and we should pay attention to that as a community. But at the end of the day, someone has to, or everyone has to secure their own networks and devices. Now, securing, securing this information on behalf of somebody whose primary um, function is healthcare related. Cybersecurity is not necessarily a healthcare predicament. It is a predicament across all industries. Is there a cost related to this to the healthcare providers and the holders of this information? 
I think there's some particular uh, costs in healthcare because of the sensitivity of protected health. No, no, I, I'm talking about are these systems free? In order to secure this information, to get the, the cyber software, to hire companies to protect it, to, to figure out how to better protect yourself because this cyber, these cyber attacks are getting more and more sophisticated, right? right? So in other words, if somebody were to say, oh, we finally secured our system in 2019, is that system likely going to cost money to keep it upgraded and up to speed for today's cybersecurity attacks? There, there are some free tools and resources out there, but for the most part, yes. Uh, it, it, you, there's, there's a need for continued investment. So just like any business in any ecosystem, they're just going to have to take that somewhere out of their, the way they charge for, for their services, what have you, and then pay more and more money. Everybody's paying more and more money to make sure that they're able to secure their systems from attacks, correct? On the margin, there are some ways where people transfer risk or have insurance and things like that. But yes, for the most part, people have to. Well, an insurance ain't free. Right. right. Right? So in other words, they're going to have to pay money to just secure the information when the information is important, but it's not necessarily directly related to the services in which they're in existence for. Correct? I think for the most, for the most part. Yes or no, sir? Sure. Yes. I'm running out of time. Thank you. Thank you. I thought it was pretty straightforward. Um, uh, um, Dr. Brigaman, uh, as a provider, how has this attack impacted your ability to provide care to vulnerable patient populations? And if you care to share part of the answers to some of my questions that I asked about the cost and the effort it takes to secure information. Yeah, the cost to a independent, to per physician from a physician practice is probably in excess of $10,000 a year, uh, maybe. Per patient, you said? Per Per physician. Oh, okay, per, per physician. physician. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, to secure a practice at this point. As far as how it's impacted my practice, we've only collected about 50% of the dollars that have been billed since the attack occurred over the last two, two months. And so you can imagine what that does given the tight margins. Okay, thank you very much. I'm out of time. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and I recognize Mr. Latta for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I uh, begin my questioning, if I may, I'd like to submit this uh, trust report uh, for the record without objection. Thank you very much. Well, again, uh, thank you very much to our witnesses for being with us today. And during my tenure in Congress, I've had the pleasure to watch our health infrastructure grow far beyond what many uh, people have thought. We're able to reach patients further, treat them faster, and save lives. Unfortunately, as we've grown, we've uh, with some, some of those who wish to harm us. As chair of the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology, I've long advocated filling the gaps in our health system and as a partnership between the public and private sector to secure and protect our American consumers. Most people don't attribute health care data as a national security threat. This can be any further th from the truth. The February 21st change healthcare cyber attack by Black Hat affected the whole healthcare sector, disrupted pharmacy services, delayed claims, and put Americans at risk. What scares me is that this is just the tip of the iceberg as to what bad actors could do to our health infrastructure. We must do better to protect and defend against cyber attacks. And I know in my district through the years, uh, I've had seven different FBI uh, different seminars uh, that they've uh, commended to uh, advise people about cybersecurity. And I pretty much can say this, as I've started a lot of those through the years, I'm sure a lot of the people that were in the audience looked at me and thought, Lada has got to be paranoid. But I said, I'd always read their face and I said, by the time these two guys get done with you, you're all gonna be paranoid. But uh, uh, our cybersecurity is the number one issue out there. And Mr. Riggy, if I could start with you, when we have a breach, bad actors may be able to use collected health information to withhold certain items such as critical active pharmaceutical ingredients. Could you elaborate on how these cyber attacks could be just as destructive as other physical attacks? Thank you for the question. And they certainly can be absolutely as impactful as a physical attack. For instance, during a ransomware attack, which disables a hospital's networks and forces the hospital to disconnect from the internet, we have seen time and again, immediate result of a diversions of ambulances carrying stroke, heart attack, and trauma patients, the disabling of life-saving technologies such as CT scanners, imaging, radiation oncology machines. And the impact is not limited to just the hospital that was attacked. 
we have seen regional impacts as ambulances carrying patients are diverted to surrounding hospitals, which may already be at capacity, or in rural areas where the next nearest emergency department is 100 miles away and there's bad weather and the helicopter, the medevac can't fly. And we also, since we are so interconnected, when the victim hospital is shut down, your network, that actually shuts down many physicians' practices and clinics, which may ride on the backbone of that hospital. So there's a regional impact, and quite frankly, which I often describe as the ransomware blast radius. There was a regional impact, really requiring a regional disaster response. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sheldon, recently the United States Department of Commerce's National Institute of Standards and Technology awarded Bowling Green State University in my district close to $200,000 to bolster and build our cybersecurity workforce. I'm proud we are reaching uh, younger generations, strengthening current academic institutions. How are we currently investing in cybersecurity and what steps could be taken to immediately bolster these defense capabilities? Thank you for the question. I think the overwhelming focus for the cybersecurity community in the past couple of years has been trying to um, heighten requirements for, um, for reporting breaches under the idea that that will get people to uh, invest more proactively in cybersecurity. I think there's uh, an opportunity for us to focus more on resourcing the problem so that people, especially that are resource constrained, have the opportunity to get better training uh, more secure technologies and to identify better risk management plans, that sort of thing. So there have been some discussions today about making further investments. I think there's a lot of different parts in the community that have leverage that can apply those investments and we should look at that. Okay, thank you. In my last 24 seconds, Mr. Garcia, unfortunately after this most recent cyber attack, many health safety nets were impacted significantly with processing claims, some up to six weeks. Most of the providers don't have the cash on hand, and a lot of, the, and also the, the patients out there don't have the dollars in their checkbooks to be able to pay for the uh, the different medications they need. What are your recommendations to streamline payments so, in the event of a future attack, our system faces less disruption? Thank you for the question. Uh, the recommendation we make is is that. Um, the government and industry need to ramp up their incident response and recovery capability uh, to include uh, such actions as, you know, accelerating payments, uh, suspending uh, regulatory choke points um, so that victims can get as immediate uh, support as, as they possibly can. Well, thank you. Mr. Chair, my time has expired and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Recognize Ms. Schreier from Washington. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Madam Ranking Member. Uh, thank you to all of the witnesses who are here today to discuss the change healthcare cyber attack. Uh, I, like many other members here today, have heard from providers, hospitals, patients in my district who were impacted by the change healthcare attack. And the bottom line is that this security breach revealed major weaknesses in our current healthcare system, and there's no reason to believe these attacks will subside anytime soon. In, in recent years, healthcare has become a prime target for cyber attacks because patient data is gold. Uh, it has medical records, financial information, social security numbers, names, addresses, and more. And as a body, we need to do more to fix the root of the problem, as we've been discussing today, which I, I hope to explore a little bit more today. Uh, first, I just wanted to highlight an example from my district, at Kittitas Valley Healthcare, a small rural hospital in my district. Uh, the change attack was devastating for them. Uh, to date, they have only recouped 50% of their regular March receipts. Nearly two months since the attack, they are still submitting claims manually, uh, which requires not just training up of staff, uh, but an incredible amount of staff and administrative work. Uh, they're reporting that uh, most insurance payers are unwilling to work with them to make any accommodations due to the cyber attack. And I'll remind all of you that this is a not, not a large hospital system. This is a rural hospital whose patient population is 40% Medicare. Uh, so the impact to them has been disproportionately high when compared to other hospitals. So I wanted to ask a bit about uh, other commercial payers. 
Uh, in Washington, we have an abundance of small regional plans that don't have the capacity to process claims by paper. And they're working hard to overcome the impact of this attack. However, I've heard from a couple hospitals, including Kittitas Valley Hospital, uh, that many national commercial payers have refused to provide any flexibility. Uh, so this means that while hospitals are forced to file claims by paper, some large insurance uh, plans are still requiring prior authorizations and timely filing. And frankly, I don't see a lot of incentive for these plans to not just sit on the money that they're holding. And I remained concerned that while they're doing that for their bottom line, meanwhile, providers and patients are just left hanging. And um, Mr. Ridgey, can you talk a little bit more about the experience that your member hospitals have been facing when it comes to working with other commercial payers um, other than United? Yes, thank you for the question. And we have heard the same thing as that you've described that other commercial payers are reluctant or simply refusing to provide beneficial terms for advance payments. And as our uh, hospitals struggle with manual processes, we heard a story just the other day that a hospital talked about manually filing a 600-page single claim on one patient. It took an entire day. And you can imagine with thousands of claims backed up, the resources and time and again, this labor has to come from somewhere. And how is that potentially impacting patient care? We think the industry could do and should have done a much better job at enduring this situation. Um, I agree with you. And that time commitment is both in the hospital, the doctor's office, and then again on the payer's side where they have to sort through a bunch of paper claims. I mean, it has really just slowed, if not pause the entire healthcare payment system. And, and that's just the beginning, because once it's in the system, then it has to be edited. Often these claims get rejected, sent back, and so there's additional layers of processing. And in the meantime, the insurers sit on the reimbursements. Uh, I have very limited time. There's a quick question for each of you. Uh, in 2022, the Department of Justice sued to block United Health Group's acquisition of Change Healthcare on the basis that there would be too much consolidation and it would control over half of Americans' health insurance claims. Uh, this attack suggests those concerns were, were valid. So uh, a question just down the line for each of you. Uh, do you. Did you support the merger of Change and United and do you think consolidation in the health sector will lead to increased risk and increased numbers of cyber attacks? We'll start with you, Mr. Garcia. Yes, we didn't take a position on on the case itself, but um, as I state in my recommendations, that um, all future such mergers and acquisitions need to be considered um, on the basis, among other considerations, on whether that consolidation would result in higher cyber risk that that would result in something like change healthcare. Thank you. I'm out of time, so super quick answers if you have them. Go, go ahead. I'll give you the latitude. Everyone answer the question. With apologies, I don't have an opinion on it. Okay. The American Hospital Association did not and vocally opposed the merger, and because of the sector-wide risk that we understood this would pose. I don't believe we took a position on it, but I would just point to... Uh, Mr. Garcia's testimony about mapping the infrastructure, that even if we have these consolidations, we need multiple ways of dealing with them. I think physicians probably feel the effects of consolidation as much as anyone, and most, if not all, physician groups are strongly opposed to vertical integration of the healthcare system, given the cost that it creates for the system. I agree. I would say yes, and this needs much more scrutiny. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I over, overstayed my Finally, time. Yield yield. Back. Recognize Mr. Bilirakis, five minutes. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the change uh, healthcare ransomware attack is the most consequential health-related cyber attack in our nation's history. It is critical that we not only address the needs of the provider and patient community following the change attack, but that we are also proactive in preventing similar attacks like this from happening wherever possible. That's why we're having this committee. The subcommittee I chair, the Innovation Data and Commerce Subcommittee, is considering draft legislation, landmark legislation, to establish a national data privacy and security standard for consumers. 
the American Privacy Rights Act. And while that bill exempts HIPAA compliant entities from a dual regulatory uh, regime, I do think it's important that the entire healthcare sector regularly adopt best practices and take from the bill's principles such as data minimization, vulnerability assessments, information retention and disposal policies, and uh, the use of the privacy enhancing technologies. So uh, Mr. Sheldon, I appreciate that in your written testimony, you note the importance of the work on the data privacy bill, by the way, led by our, our distinguished chairperson and our ranking member. What recommendations do you have for the healthcare sector to leverage artificial intelligence, privacy enhancing technologies, and other best practices to better protect against new threats as they appear? Again, for Mr. Sheldon, please. Thank you. It's been really quite something to watch, the advancement and development of artificial intelligence over the last year or so, uh, based on consumer applications. But really, in the security community, there has been AI and ML in use for a long period of time, years, to identify and defeat novel threats. I think there are some specific applications that people can work on based on this new technology that might relate directly to healthcare, but in general, the most straightforward pathway to get some of these technologies into the hands of people who are providing care is for their service providers, the security technologies and applications that they're using to experiment, integrate those sort of natively into, uh, into um, the technologies that they produce. So both of those things will happen and we'll see more uptake of uh, this sort of technology over time. Thank you. Uh, one piece of legislation I worked on last Congress was the Ransomware Act that required the, uh, an FTC report on cross-border complaints regarding ransomware attacks committed by our foreign adversaries, as well as recommendations on how to mitigate against ransomware. Mr. McLean and Mr. Garcia, what are some key ways and best practices the healthcare sector broadly can take to protect against ransomware attacks where it's feasible? Thank you for the question. I, I commented earlier on some of the best practices that are laid out in NIST frameworks and also the 405D uh, framework uh, about being able to protect ourselves. So I, I think this uh, happens with uh, technical, administrative, uh, behavioral, and physical controls in our environments. I think the uh, information sharing that happens is uh, extremely valuable to us uh, as we learn about an ever-changing threat landscape. and. It is, um, was asked earlier if this is expensive and time consuming, it certainly is. It's something that uh, Mr. Sheldon said, it's not a, a destination, it's a journey. This is something we're working on regularly, every day, talking about. Um, and because the technology and threats are changing, it is uh, it's something that we have to regularly upgrade and patch systems and put a lot of effort into working with all of our technology partners to discover vulnerabilities and, and do that work to, to be as safe as we can. Thank you, uh, Mr. Garcia. I, I, I align myself with Mr. McLean's uh, remarks. The, uh, he mentioned the 405D framework. Um, that is what has resulted in the health industry cybersecurity practices that HHS and the Sector Coordinating Council developed uh, together, first published in early 2019. It is a, um, it is a formulary for how the health industry needs to practice those basic cybersecurity controls uh, that will help us reduce the incidence of, of, of ransomware attacks. We just need to get the awareness and the uptake and the implementation across the healthcare industry of those practices. They're there. They're ready to be implemented. And we'll need the help of the government, we'll need the help of the Congress to be sure that the rest of the healthcare community knows that that's available and they just need to invest in it. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. I have one more question, but I'll submit it for the record, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I recognize Ms. Kelly from Illinois, five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Rank Member Eshu for holding today's important hearing. Cybersecurity attacks on vital infrastructure are increasing in frequency and severity. 
The recent change healthcare attack serves as a stark reminder of the extensive vulnerabilities within our healthcare system and the devastating impact a single attack can have, potentially crippling our entire system. The attack disrupted patients' access to care, provider reimbursement, and potentially released protected health information to an unknown number of patients. And over 60 days later, many providers are still suffering from the ramifications of the initial attack. Many of us are worried about the system's capacity to withstand cyber attacks and the persistent threat to patient safety and public health. Our, healthcare, our area healthcare systems are struggling to address is the security risks associated with an increasingly mobile workforce and the use of shared workstations, devices, and third-party software. Research from the Pinoman Institute shows that more than half of organizations have experienced a breach from unauthorized access on employee-owned mobile devices. The change healthcare attack indicates an increasing persistence and sophistication of today's threat actors, showing their, that healthcare organizations must bolster cyber defenses across all endpoints. Mr. Sheldon, how can health systems develop robust cybersecurity and access management strategies to address unique security risks associated with the increasing use of mobile technologies in healthcare settings, aiming to enhance safety and protect patient data? Thank you. I've mentioned a couple times today the concept of having a robust and mature security program. And I think that that's very important because in dynamic spaces like this where there are new technologies and systems being implemented all the time, you need to have a process for assessing the new risks or threats that those uh, systems might pose or, or introduce. And the best way to do that is to have a very secure baseline uh, for core technology and security needs across the enterprise. And then every time there's one of these new systems that might enable remote treatment, remote care, or some, you know, maybe a specialized device that allows a new um, uh, type of uh, uh, assessment or, um, uh, secu or health benefit to be able to look at that very closely and understand whether that changes anything fundamentally about the security architecture or what other investments you might need in order to protect the entire extended enterprise. Thank you for your response. Given the diverse landscape of healthcare facilities, I'm particularly interested in understanding the unique threats faced by different types of systems, such as large urban, academic hospitals versus rural hospitals, my districts, urban, suburban, and rural. Mr. Riggi, is that correct? Could you shed light on how hospitals, regardless of their size or location, can proactively safeguard their systems against these threats? Are there best practices or specific measures that can be universally applied? Thank you for the question. There are certainly the best practices as described here, which could be applicable to any type of hospital. And hospitals all need to understand their unique cyber risk profile. Rural hospitals need to understand that even though they're remote, once they connect to the internet, they are accessible to the bad guys. So treating cyber risk as an enterprise risk issue, applying best practices to defend against these attacks, multi-layered defense, and then be ready with good, secure offline backups to restore in case you're attacked and map the impact. Because you know, we've been talking a lot about data theft, data protection, which is very important, but we have to understand the risk to the patients when life-saving technology is disabled. As we always say at the AHA, a ransomware attack, any cyber attack which disrupts and delays healthcare delivery is a threat to life crime. And we need the government's assistance on this as well. Thank you. Mr. Garcia, your testimony highlights the necessity of establishing a cyber safety net to safeguard our nation's most underserved providers as many of the providers struggle to retain clinical staff, let alone hire cybersecurity experts. Can you offer potential measures you, you would propose to address this issue and quickly? <laughs> yes, thank you. I mean, I think it is a combination of uh, government support in terms of, of funding. Um, and also industry support. They're, they're, we are an interconnected ecosystem. There are large hospitals within a region uh, that include smaller health providers. And they are mutually dependent in many ways. So there, there are ways to have a, a, uh, you know, a cyber civil defense as well, where we are all working together because we depend on each other. Thank you, and I yield back. Shelley, you'll back and give some latitude to the ranking member for just one second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I think it's important to insert this into the record. 
Wall Street Journal today, United Health stock jumps after earnings beat expectations despite cyber attack. Without objection. I now recognize Mr. Carter <clears throat> for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here. Uh, obviously, this is a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a very important uh, subject matter. It, uh, what has happened here has impacted healthcare professionals, but more imp importantly, it's impacted patients, and that's what we have to keep in mind. Look, I'm a, I'm a big critic of the vertically integrated healthcare system that we have in our country right now. As a pharmacist for over 40 years, I experienced the vertical integration that exists where United Healthcare owns the PBM, one of the largest PBMs in the country, that owns the group purchasing organization, that owns the pharmacy, that owns the doctor, the largest employer of doctors here in our country, employing over 9,000 doctors, almost 10% of the whole uh, medical field or 10% of all doctors. And, and I'm just not a fan of it. And I, I think, and I, I've said, and I'll say publicly that I think the, the FTC more than any other agency has failed the American people by allowing this vertical integration to, to happen. It, it needs to be busted up. But nevertheless, um, I wanted to ask you, and, and I, I kind of wanted to open it up and ask all of you, do you think it's more of a, a national security risk when a vertically integrated healthcare system like United Healthcare and Change Healthcare are not adequately pro protected against cyber attacks? Dr. Brueggemann, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think, in my opinion, larger healthcare systems and entities vertically integrated have more points of entry that, that can be exploited. They have more money to pay when ransomware comes around than an individual physician practice and therefore a better target. And I think we should look at and study whether or not vertical integration is leading to or some component of the increase in cyber attacks. Mr. McLean? I think the answer to your question is yes, and the, the risks and the mitigations are widely varied depending on the organization and what we're dealing with. I think it is a national security risk because we are one of the 16 uh, critical infrastructures, and if we're disrupted, then everyone is. And um, the cyber risks are just increasingly varied, and uh, the defenses are not, not fail-proof. Good. Agreed. National security issue, especially when you have an organization like United that touches every hospital in the country, has access to one in three uh, healthcare records, and has sensitive data on the military. Absolutely a national security issue. And these groups that attack us are provided safe harbor by hostile nation states. So they risk national security and public health and safety broadly. Thank you. Never looked at that issue specifically, although I will say that we are, as an industry, paying much more attention about verticalized concentration risks within IT ecosystems. And that's something that deserves attention in its own right. Thank you. Yes, healthcare is critical infrastructure, and, and critical infrastructure is designated as, as national security, just as electricity and telecommunications and financial services, water, transportation. We are in that category that um, should not have concentration of any one or few entities controlling that critical infrastructure. Dr. Brueggemann, let me ask you, you're an independent practitioner. Um, how, how is your practice responding to the interruption in claims processing and prior authorization denials? Um, you know, when I was practicing pharmacy, I'm on pharmacies, you know, prior approvals. I mean, I, I had a, 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 an employee totally dedicated to nothing but prior approvals. Yeah, prior authorization has become an increasingly burdensome environment. The good news for me is I'm in Texas and we have a Gold Card Act. I know that we've looked at that at a, at a federal level as well, but that has certainly helped us because I am actually a Gold Carded physician and am able to utilize that to reduce my burden. Um, you know, we have used a secondary clearinghouse when we can. Uh, there are some secondary clearinghouses that are allowing us without uh, an electronic agreement with them to be able to use them, but this has been a significant burden on our staff. Right. Let me ask any of you, and, and look, I, I preface my remarks by, by telling you the way I feel, and you understand that. But have you heard of, are you aware of any circumstances or any instances, I should say, where United Healthcare Optum is exploiting physicians' cash shortfalls and resulting in change cyber attack to acquire struggling practices? Any? Yeah, Please. Yes. I mean, in the middle of March, I think we all heard about Corvallis Clinic in Oregon, which was acquired by Optum. They requested emergency acquisition as a result of shortage of cash flows. 
and uh, uh, the purchaser was Optum. So Optum purchased this clinic. Uh, Anyone else? Thank you, Dr. Brooklyn. Any Yes, sir. We, we are hearing the same reports. These really almost amount Mr. to... Mr. Chairman, how alarming is this? How alarming is this? I, I, I'm, I'm at a loss for words. I just cannot believe this. And thank all of you for being here today. Mr. Chairman, we've got to address this situation. Thank you, and I yield back. Couldn't agree more. Gentleman yields back. Recognize Ms. Custer. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Eshoo for this very timely bipartisan uh, hearing. I, I certainly agree with the frustration, and I would actually encourage the chair to subpoena United Healthcare. I think they should be here today, and I'm appalled, frankly, as a corporate citizen that they didn't choose to participate. The change healthcare and cyber attack has shown how interconnected our healthcare system has become and the work that remains to keep that system secure. The attack, as we've heard today, caused disruption for patients, providers, pharmacies, and payers. In my district and all across this country, smaller rural hospitals were especially hurt by delayed claims processing. Just in my district in New Hampshire, four hospitals have reported that over 50% of their revenue has been jeopardized because of this attack. These are lifeline hospitals. They're difficult to keep open. They are nonprofit organizations supported by our community. In total, they estimate they are not receiving $2.5 million per day. Do the math all across this country. That amount of lost revenue threatens care in rural areas where hospitals often run on thin operating margins with little to no cash on hand. While United Healthcare Group's Optum Unit has launched the Temporary Funding Assistance Program to help providers bridge the gap in short-term cash flows, I'm concerned that smaller rural hospitals aren't getting the financial relief they need. So Mr. Riggi, what steps has the American Hospital Association taken to help rural and safety net hospitals, and what do you think we should do to support them from uh, cyber attacks and from the very disappointing response from United Healthcare. Thank you for your question. First, we have been working and advocating directly with United to loosen up the funds, provide those funds for those hospitals in need. And we sent a letter to them, uh, pushing them to provide these advanced and accelerated payments to loosen up their contract terms to get these funds to flow. We are strongly encouraging other payers to do that. We lobbied uh, the government. We, we presented to the government, to CMS, to provide advanced and accelerated payments. It came late, but they are providing those as well. Understanding the funds are the lifeline, not for the hospital, but for the patients. Keep the hospital open, keep our doors open to serve our communities and patients. And ultimately, we are, we are strongly suggesting that hospitals do what they can, reasonably and financially, to enhance their cybersecurity defenses. But recognizing hospitals are not cybersecurity companies. Job one is to take care of patients and save lives. So we have to depend on the community. We, can, we have to do what we can, but we need resources from the government, and we need the government to go after the bad actors overseas. This is not purely a defensive issue. We need to encourage offensive operations by the U.S. government against these foreign hackers, degrade their capability to attack us. And looking forward, Mr. McClain, do you have any recommendations on how we can help small hospitals prepare and respond to future cyber attacks? Thank you for the question, and we share the alarm about the impact on uh, these small and rural hospitals. I think uh, advocating for uh, funding uh, for these uh, hospitals to adopt the, the uh, cybersecurity best practices outlined under 405D I think that uh, Mr. Garcia's organization, along with CHIME, have helped our, our members uh, do that. Um, I think there are also um, an annual security risk assessment provided by the uh, ONC office that has been helpful to our, our smaller providers. And um, I think that they participate in larger conversations with bigger organizations who are better resourced, and this is a, a way that they can, we can help them as well. Uh, I do have a little bit more time, so I'll keep going. I'm concerned about the amount of patient data that's reportedly been compromised. Millions of people have had their data exposed, and federal law requires they be notified. Additionally, consumers may need additional support to protect themselves from future fraud. Uh, Mr. Rigi, do you have any recommendations on how we can help Americans whose private data 
was exposed by this attack? Well, first, let me clarify, we have no confirmation of the data that data was actually stolen. We know there's a lot of media reports, but we'll have to wait for official confirmation from United or the government. But certainly for individual patients, regardless of if their data has been compromised anywhere, they should monitor their credit bureaus to look for unauthorized credit applications, monitor their healthcare statements, looking for unauthorized charges as well. And, uh, you know, we strongly suggest there's a great government resource known as identitytheft.gov, which walks through an individual, um, individual steps if a consumer's had their identity stolen. So including credit bureau freezes and so forth, and credit bureau alerts. I think that's a good resource to start. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I yield back. Kelly yields back. Recognize Ms. Harshbarger, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. This is disturbing, to say the least. Um, I guess this is for Mr. Garcia or Mr. Sheldon. How many different federal agencies are involved in cybersecurity responses? Uh, boy, that's a that's a big question. I think the Department of Homeland Security CISA is is the front and center, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure yeah. Security Agency. Um, and for incident response. Uh, and, and then, of course, all of the other sector risk management agencies that deal with their given critical sector uh, serve some role as well at various levels of maturity sophistication. Yeah, it's uh, HHS coordinates with uh, CISA, then ASPR through their SIP division leads the HHS efforts. You know, when I served on Homeland, we had... Uh, they would do the cyber hygiene for uh, public companies. Do you know if Optum or Change Healthcare went through cyber hygiene vulnerability scanning recently, or have they ever? I do not know if they did. Hmm. Okay. Uh, United Health Group first announced the Change Healthcare cyber attack on February 21st, and yet it took the administration until March the 5th to put out a press release about a cyber attack that was impacting all parts of the healthcare system. Why do you think there was a delay in that? And anyone can answer this. On behalf of the American Hospital Association, we were certainly keeping in contact with them mm -hmm. to help them understand the gravity of the situation. They may, not, they may not have recognized how much of an impact this was across the sector. Yeah, huge, huge impact. You know, they report, there's reports that uh, United Healthcare paid 22 million wow. in, um, ransom, but they haven't confirmed that yet. Does anybody know if they did or did not pay it? Hmm. I know that you have a hierarchy of these ransomware companies, and they have shareholders. It's crazy, but what are they doing? You know, we know they're in it for the money, but what are they doing with, your, with our health care data? Can anybody tell me that? Yes, ma'am. Um, generally, what they'll do is try to monetize that data. Yeah. So these foreign-based groups will, again, uh, try to use the data to continue to conduct other types of fraud, identity theft fraud, yeah. which can be used for other commercial frauds, or false billing. And we do have instances where uh, nation state, hostile nation states will use that data for intelligence purposes yeah. to identify government employees, illnesses they may have, and potentially use it for recruitment of uh, people, government employees in sensitive positions. This is crazy. And we had a breach. If you had government insurance not long ago, th there was a breach there. Correct. TRICARE was part of the alleged breach data here. Yeah, this is, this is nefarious, nefarious. Mr. Rigi, how does changing clearing houses affect healthcare entities? So the clearing house is, again, part of that digitally interconnected ecosystem, and that is the funnel or the conduit that we yeah. would use for our revenue cycle to yeah. submit claims. If that's not available, of course, those claims back up. Eventually, like a pipeline, the funds coming back to us dry up. Yeah. So it is, again, financially, it is very devastating for the hospital. It is. Administrative cost and the timing and Absolutely. I understand that. I've been a pharmacist for almost as long as Buddy has. And uh, when you deal with these clearing houses, just like you, um, Dr. Brueggemann, I, I, I feel for you because I know when you are waiting on payment to come through a clearing house or you have central pay where they control what they put in or what they can take out, it's unbelievable. And uh, 
you know, the vertical integration is a, a travesty. And I'll tell you, when we talk to Asper and when we've talked, I've had many people comment to me, whether it's a hospital, pharmacy, or a independent provider, they should have taken advance payments, should have been offered to these providers based on an, a historical average, maybe take the last 90 days average. Insurance companies should have suspended as many of these administrative hurdles as possible, like the uh, prior approvals, filing deadlines, unique claim editing requirements, um, because what you're doing now is you're getting these denials because of the time frame. And, uh, but the, the prior approval claims weren't waived, the claims weren't paid, questions weren't answered, and this is a multi-billion dollar company. And it's a pittance of what they gave to providers and pharmacies, and we're still waiting after eight weeks. Uh, but what you said a minute ago, it's inconceivable that Optum purchased those practices during this crisis. And it's unbelievable that you're getting payments without getting an EOB or an explanation of benefits. How do you know how to reconcile your files or what your budget's got? And, and people are getting billed, so talk to me about that. Yeah, I would tell you probably the, the worst number I heard from my team was that every time we have to reconcile a single payment, it takes us approximately 20 minutes from when we identify the payment to when we actually get it reconciled. So imagine that times every single payment, 20 minutes, every single payment, how many, pay, how many staff members we have to employ to get through the backlog. At some point in time, honestly, we're going to probably just cut it off and say we can't even look backwards. We've got to keep looking forwards because we just don't have enough staff and enough time to, to chase down all the dollars. Yeah, I agree. And this is forcing that one payer system. If they, people don't think we have it, they better look closely. When you've got United Healthcare employing more physicians, owning the pharmacy, pharmacy benefit manager, your specialty pharmacies, we've said this all along. And we complained when CBS bought Caremark years ago, what's wrong with the FTC? And I guess my last question is, should we be urging the Federal Trade Commission to undertake retrospective merger reviews? And everybody can answer that. I mean, I think the answer is absolutely. They, there's been some concern that vertical integration doesn't truly meet the, the, the definitions of monopolies. I, I think obviously we need to really consider how vertically, how interconnected vertically integrated companies are. Yes. Yes, with particular consideration to the cybersecurity vulnerabilities we talked about earlier. Yes. I would agree. An examination of the cyber vulnerabilities when there is sector-wide impact such yeah. as this. Apologies, no position. Agreed. If, if a merger and acquisition is going to result in higher security risk, that needs to be considered. Yeah, absolutely. Thank LA you yields that. back. Recognize Dr. Joyce, five minutes. Thank you, Chair, for holding this important hearing, and thank you for the panel for testifying today. Delays related to the change healthcare attack have caused extreme burdens on patient care and disrupted cash flow for physicians and hospitals across the country. It has been reported that United Health Group has exploited this crisis in order to acquire health practices that are in urgent need of revenue just to keep their doors open. While patients and physicians are still struggling, United Health's day-to-day -day operations have continued. This underscores that while Change Healthcare was the target of this ransomware attack, ultimately the patients and the physicians were and continue to be the real victims. United Health has the resources necessary to keep themselves operational in spite of this cyber attack. Through acquiring large parts of the medical sector, including Change Healthcare, because of this consolidation, an attack on one entity has caused a massive disruption for the rest of the healthcare system. As we see increased consolidation in healthcare, I worry that incidents like this will only become increasingly more common. We have already seen that physicians and patients are encountering yet another consequence throughout the fallout of this cybersecurity failure. I have heard from health systems throughout my district that they were incentivized through discounts to use many of Change Healthcare's products. Mr. Rigi, when one company has such a large presence in an operation of many different physician practices, how does this increase of cyber attack amplify the effects of such an effect? Thank you for the question. Clearly, as we've seen, their interconnectivity results in, a, in this impact because their loss of services, those mission-critical services, disrupt care across the entire sector. And 
often, as was discussed earlier, smaller practices, smaller hospitals, even the largest systems have very little negotiating power with the company the size of United. So their loss of mission critical services cause a disruptive cascading effect across the entire sector. So regarding this cascading effect that Mr. Rigi just talked about, Dr. Brueggemann, how can we ensure that necessary cybersecurity improvements are implemented across the healthcare sector without overburdening independent practices like yours or rural physician practices with the outrageous cost of these technologies? Yeah, I don't know that I'm uh, smart enough to know all the answers to the cybersecurity questions, but certainly what I do know is that we need to reduce the amount of burden on the physician practices, both financial and administrative. And so whatever the answer is or whatever the solution is, we need to make sure that it has the least amount of impact, particularly on smaller practices, rural hospitals. Those are our critical infrastructure that will be impacted. And those critical infrastructures that you mentioned, that's what the hospitals and the physicians that I represent in South Central and Southwestern Pennsylvania. Dr. Brueggemann, continuing, can you speak about the experience of independent physicians like yourself attempting to interact with the relief mechanisms or the workarounds provided by Change Healthcare? I mean, honestly, we didn't even attempt at some point. We saw the stories that had come back from the large groups that were hundreds of thousands of dollars in need and were getting thousands of dollars in response, and there was no chance that it was worth the amount of time. We had limited resources to go chase down these dollars and ultimately continue to try and bill and put things in place so that when the clearinghouse opened, we would get paid. There was not enough money there for us to go chase down the dollars from Change Healthcare. It had too many strings attached, it was too difficult, and there wasn't enough money involved. Was switching back to paper billing, was that a viable option for any practice? It was not. Was there an additional delay that would have occurred by switching back to paper billing? We know for sure, at least with the Medicare payment claims, that we were told it would be another 45 days beyond when we switched over to paper claims that it would take for Medicare to get through the backlog. So the insurance carriers were backlogged as well as we were. There was no chance that paper billing made sense. Was a suggestion to switch to another clearinghouse, was that a viable option? Unfortunately, the clearinghouse is geared by our electronic medical record. It's not something that I get to select. Uh, we are using one other clearinghouse, but unfortunately, most of those clearinghouses require another electronic agreement for each payer, and many payers were not allowing us to bill through secondary clearinghouses. And then finally, Dr. Brueggemann, what about the advanced payments that were offered by CMS? Was that something that you reached out to obtain? Uh, we did not. At that point in time, we were already uh, through the road of uh, attempting to work through Availity, which is an alternative clearinghouse, and that was where all of our effort was spent. Mr. Chairman, thank you. My time has expired, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Recognize Mr. Obernolte, five minutes. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me share the frustration expressed by some of my colleagues that no one from Change or from United is here to answer questions. So uh, I'll ask some of the questions I would have asked them if they were here, and I'm hoping that uh, with all the expertise here on the panel, we can get it answered. Uh, first of all, let me point out the fact that uh, we've had some really valuable testimony about how to prevent future cyber attacks. But I think that uh, although that there have been great, some great suggestions, and we should certainly do a lot of the things that have been suggested, it's not going to solve the problem, right? We're, this is going to be with us uh, just because Closing off cyber attacks is a completely is a fool's errand because it restricts the uh, the usage of uh, uh, of legitimate users, right? So, I, I think we also need to simultaneously focus on response to cyber attacks. So, you know, first of all, uh, let me express my frustration that the Colonial Pipeline hack was three years ago. Three years ago, the same ransomware, same ransomware group, same method of attack. Uh, the same debilitating functionality, same impact on our infrastructure. How on earth are we sitting here today talking about an identical cyber attack that took weeks to respond to? I don't understand. I mean, it, it's, it, this isn't rocket science, right? We've, uh, how are we not able to develop infrastructure where we can't just, uh, doc, Mr. Rigi, you were talking about restoring from backups. Why, why is it the work of more than a day just to, to take all the systems offline, disconnect them from each other, and one by one restore them from the backup from the day before. Why can we not do that? Well, I'm certainly not speaking for United, but in general terms, even if you do have good offline secure backups in, employing the latest what we call immutable technology, meaning that even if the bad guys reach the backups, which they'll try to do, 
they won't be able to alter, delete, or encrypt them. And as some of my technology experts will, uh, I think, confirm here, it is a very slow, methodical process to restore systems from backup. It's not like flipping a light switch. You gotta first figure out how did the bad guys get in, you gotta make sure that entry point vulnerability's been closed, you gotta make sure that they're no longer in your system, and then it's a slow, methodical process for restoration, uh, literally application by application, server by server. So we, you know, we would hope a company like United had the capability, if anybody would have the capability, they would have the capability to restore faster. Right, well it just seems like we've had three years to think about this problem. Uh, it doesn't seem like asking too much for anyone that has a, a sophisticated network architecture that's critical infrastructure to look at their architecture and put together a continuity of business plan that lets them restore that in less than a day. I mean, I think that everybody is gonna need to take a look at that. Now, let me ask this uh, question since no one, uh, no one that I've spoken to seems to have the answer. So, uh, United paid $22 million in Bitcoin to Black Hat for an, a decryption key. Was the restoration of their services as a result of the receipt of that key, or did they restore it through, uh, through as we've been discussing, uh, restoring it from backups? I'm not sure if that question, you know, I'm not in a position to answer that. That's Does only anyone know? Reports. Okay, well, the reason it's pertinent is because uh, Colonial paid $4, billion, $4 million in Bitcoin for a decryption key, but it turned out to be so, the decryption process turned out to be so slow that uh, restoring from backups was faster. So, I mean, here's a related question. We you know we're talking about how to prevent future cyber attacks. One good way of preventing it is not to pay ransom. Right, if no one paid a ransom, guess what? We wouldn't have any cyber attacks because there'd be no profit incentive. So let me ask the question, does, and anyone on the panel would be interested in your opinion, should United had, have paid the ransom? So coming from the FBI, I'll just give what the standard guidance is. Of course, we strongly discourage any entity to pay ransom because it encourages these type of attacks. And But yet at the same time, there is uh, there is no... I think support to ban ransom payments totally, only in the sense that if patient safety is at risk, um, then it becomes a business decision. Even the FBI says they strongly discourage payment of ransom, but ultimately it's a business decision. So if, if patient lives are at risk, then of course, then there's gonna have to be a very difficult decision made. Sure, I understand. And I'm not in favor of, through government fiat, uh, restricting people from paying ransom. But my point is, if no one paid a ransom, this problem would go away. Uh, anyway, th I see my time's expired, but let me just reiterate the point that it's been three years since Colonial, right? Anyone with a complex network infrastructure that's vulnerable to this kind of attack needs to be looking at their infrastructure, putting together continuity of business plans that make it so that they can restore their, uh, their functionality in less than a day. There is no excuse at this point. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back, recognize Mr. Pence, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for appearing here today. Cyber attacks continue to threaten the integrity of our nation's healthcare industry, and, and as my colleagues have discussed today, the attack on change healthcare was felt across our nation, including right in Indiana, my home state. Columbus Regional Hospital, located in my hometown, is expecting a delay of 50 to $60 million because 70% of their payments are run through change healthcare, and that's significant. It's a 70,000 people town. Uh, that, that's very impactful. Unfortunately, Indiana has continued to feel the impact of cyber attacks in recent years. In 2018, Hancock Regional Hospital in Greenfield, Indiana, was a victim of a cyber attack that threatened 1,400 medical records and forced our hospitals to pay 55,000 in ransom. It was even a, a featured on 60 Minutes back then. While the attack ultimately did not allow the illicit group to gain access to any files, the attack froze Hancock's IT network until a ransom was paid in, wait for it, Bitcoin. Luckily, the hospital had employed sufficiently redundant protocols that allowed care services to continue. Since then, Indiana hospitals have seen upwards of 30 similar attacks across the Hoosier State. Mr. Sheldon, 
As I mentioned in my remarks, Hancock Hospital was able to prevent the worst impacts of their cyber attack in 2018 because of redundant protocols. It is my understanding that the hospital is able to maintain all of their care during the attack and has since been made whole from the, from the initial uh, ransom. Having spent much of my career in the distribution of petroleum products, the oil and gas industry commonly separated physical operational facility technology from the broader network of the company's IT uh, infrastructure. And as my peer was talking about Colonial, uh, I think that's what, what they had in place. Are there similarities in how oil and gas operations can silo parts of their business to prevent cyber attack disruptions so that when healthcare facilities face an attack, they can continue providing care to patients in the short term while issues are addressed? Thank you, Congressman. There's an important concept in, in cybersecurity um, that pertains to segmentation of systems, particularly sensitive systems, so that you can um, apply different degrees of protections and control over different parts of the network that serve different functions, including potentially limiting access uh, from certain accounts or to open systems like the internet. So uh, that's those that concept is widely used across all critical infrastructure sectors. And it's certainly worth looking how uh, looking at how we can promote the adoption of that type of technique and strategy in places where it's not being currently used, including in healthcare. So uh, you're saying it's not being employed in healthcare like it like it was in the uh, uh, where, where it's uh, where it's not being applied where they're not entities where not people should look at that. But yeah. there are there are healthcare entities to be clear that use so, that. Concept. So uh, is that something that maybe we ought to take a look at making standards? a requirement that you separate uh, uh, the delivery of care from, say, the back room? Uh, and perhaps someone else on the panel could speak to this, but I believe there's uh, some, there is some material on this in the cyber performance goals for the healthcare sector. Uh, anybody, so that people are anybody else answer that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, in healthcare, we have these m enormous networks that are vastly complex. So a lot of medical devices, for instance, require a network connection or an internet connection to function. We've moved a lot of our electronic medical records to the cloud. So, so let me ask, I'm really unsophisticated. I'm not like my predecessor, just you know, uh, Congressman Obernolte, but uh, can you kind of batch that communication or has it got to be very, real time? It's very difficult. For instance, okay. the electronic medical record, which all clinicians need access to, might have 300 different applications that run off the electronic medical record, even to medical devices. And as you've seen with Change United, we depend on these remote third parties. So we depend on their security. We can segregate operational technologies such as HVAC systems, door controls, cameras, and so yeah. forth. But the bad guys are generally coming in through our network and internet connected technology and insecure third parties. Okay, and my time's almost expired. And thank you all for being here today. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Recognize Mr. Balderson, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to Madam Chair Rogers and Chair Guthrie for allowing me the privilege to be moved to the subcommittee. So I'm very honored to be able to do that. So thank you. Uh, my first question is for Mr. Rigi. Mr. Rigi, um, while we all embrace and value the increasingly digitalized world, we know these technologies come with risk. The change breach has so far cost all Ohio hospitals an estimated $500 million. I worry how the small rural hospitals who are already stretched resources will meet the demands of this growing threat. What resources from HHS, AHA, or state associations are available to rural hospitals? Thank you for the question. First, we are encouraging United to advance the payments and to provide more acceptable terms for that. We went to CMS as well to have them advance and accelerate payments to help ease some of that financial burden. And we've gone to the other payers without, quite frankly, much success for them to advance payments to these, especially rural hospitals that operate on such thin margins. And we are providing guidance to our hospitals, working with the Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council and the government to help provide and exchange knowledge on how to best defend networks. And we've worked directly with the FBI to exchange real-time threat intelligence so hospitals can help defend themselves. But as I've said earlier, we can do 
everything we can possibly on defense, that will not solve the issue because there's foreign bad guys out there attacking us. So again, this whole of nation approach is what is required. And ultimately, we need to start with better secured technology, secure by design, secure by default. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, our next question is for Mr. Sheldon. Mr. Sheldon, thanks for being here. Um, Congresswoman Custer and I have two tech-based initiatives to strengthen the drug supply chain. Last summer, we wrote a letter to the FDA regarding the industry's readiness for enforcement of the Drug Supply Chain Security Act, more commonly known as Track and Trace. Cybersecurity would obviously be important to ensure these systems do not be compromised. In February, building off this committee's work in 2018, we introduced a bill to require electronic prescriptions for all Schedule II through four controlled substance, including opioids. Cyber attacks on either the DSCSA or e-prescribing systems could threaten our important work to advance safe access to medicines. Just the other day, I saw an article that a cybersecurity firm has found and taken down nearly 300 websites selling fake pharmaceuticals. The hearing today is rightly focused on impacts of the change attack, but we must also think towards the future. It's important to be both reactive against bad actors and proactive to identify threats before they occur. Mr. Shelton, how can the government leverage technology like yours to go on the attack and discover bad actors such as the drug counterfeiters? Thank you. There's uh, an important role for securing systems um, that are involved in functions like the one that you described. Regrettably, I've not read the bill, and I will. Um, so it's important to start from a secure base when you're operating systems like that. And then there are parts of the government whose mission it is to go out and uh, disrupt bad actors, law enforcement agencies, um, public private partnerships like JCDC at CISA that work to uh, target bad infrastructure or infrastructure that's being leveraged by threat actors. And then there are obviously uh, Cybercom and NSA missions that uh, look to do other things to support the health of the ecosystem. And I think all of us would agree that there is an important role for government to continue to invest in those sorts of, so, sorts of capabilities to make sure that uh, it's easier for all of us to defend systems that we operate that do things like provide health care. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my remaining time. Gentleman yields back. I recognize Dr. Miller Meeks. Five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you to the witnesses for uh, testifying before the committee today. Physician practices, hospitals, pharmacy, and most importantly, patients have all experienced disruption caused by the cyber attack at Change Healthcare. And let me also just say that I'm an old enough doctor that I had paper records and paper billing, and we had none of these problems even when there was a powder, power outage. Um, Change manages 15 billion transactions a year, which equates to approximately 1.5 trillion in health claims. According to data from the American Medical Association, 80% of practices reported lost revenue from unpaid claims, and 85% stated they had to allocate additional staff time to complete additional administrative requirements. And this is in an era with very high inflation and problems getting workforce and staff. Neither doctors nor their non-physician staff will receive any additional compensation for time spent mitigating the fallout of the change attack. And this is on top of the administrative and financial burden that America's physician and healthcare workforce are already experiencing. And I have had this in a small business uh, practice where we have not received reimbursement for two months due to various CMS problems. And you as the provider go without pay to pay your staff and to pay your bills. In Iowa, doctors are very hesitant to take advance payment dollars without confirmation that their claim submission will be paid at the rate submitted. Experience with American Rescue Plan dollars, Act dollars and post-recoupment of paid claims have made providers concerned that they will be approved for payment once the backlog processing is completed. The survey also found that 55% of doctors said they had to use personal funds to cover practice expenses. Notably, the overall effects of the change attack have been most acutely felt by practices with 10 or fewer physicians. Dr. Brueggemann, can you please detail the process of patient billing and highlight the role that a clearinghouse like change plays in the process? Yeah, I mean, billing in healthcare, unfortunately, is incredibly complex. Essentially, it starts with me writing a code after I see a patient, whether we're talking about in the operating room or in a clinic, that goes to my staff. My staff, my staff scrubs that and tries to clear it and make sure it's ready to go. Then it goes to a second scrub, which is the clearinghouse that we've been talking about. Once it gets through that second scrub, it gets to the insurance company. 
the insurance company then can communicate back through that clearinghouse to us to say why they approved or denied claims, why they paid us, um, and through that process, then we uh, kind of check our checkbook and, and clear everything through. And when disruptions in patient billing processes occur, how are small and independent providers impacted differently than those who work for larger systems and are patients impacted? Yeah, I mean, small practices typically have less cash on hand, have less resources, have less ability to withstand these types of outages. And so that's what we're seeing in my practice and many other practices is having to either fund internally, uh, utilize lines of credit, and our physician, our, our, sorry, our patients are receiving bills that they were not intending to receive because we can't balance the books. We don't know what's been paid and what's not been paid. And so now they're receiving bills that are inaccurate. Um, Change Healthcare has announced that it roughly issued, uh, it issued roughly 5.5 billion in support to physicians and health systems. While it's unfortunate that they could not be here to testify today, I hope they're watching and listening. In your written testimony, Dr. Brueggemann, you stated that many of your colleagues have chosen not to utilize any of the loans from change since the attack. Uh, can you explain why? Yeah, they've openly stated they have limited insight into how much we actually bill, only what's billed to them. And so Change Healthcare has very limited ability to pay us back either through Optum or United Healthcare. As such, immediately after this occurred, many physician practices began posting or communicating through other means that there was limited funds available and that you would have to fight significantly for those funds. Given our limited resources, we dedicated all of those resources towards capturing the dollars that were needing to be billed as opposed to going after these insurance companies to get loans to cover us through those periods of time. Thank you. And Mr. McLean, I have heard from hospital systems in my district in Iowa that it will take a significant amount of time for clean claims to be submitted. They are approaching one of the most challenging periods as I, many Iowa systems were unable to bill Medicare and Medicaid for a month and a half, six weeks. Uh, even after claims start to uh, be paid out, systems will still need to pay pending invoices. Can you further detail how system disruptions like the change attack impact the inner workings of health systems, especially rural ones? Sure, we talked earlier about the disruption to patient care and have uh, outlined that a bit. I, I think the, uh, what our members have seen is significant disruption in back-end systems. You, you talked about the uh, automation um, over time, and of course automation is great, makes us more efficient, we can ha have more, more patient volume and whatnot. But when this happens, there's extreme disruption to the revenue cycle, um, our finance operations type of, of people. So. It, it can't, I think we detailed earlier, Dr. Brueggemann said, we can't physically uh, bill using paper in, in the same way. And this would be particularly uh, acute in uh, smaller, uh, less well-financed hospitals where you're actually having to employ more people in order to take care of some of these previously automated processes. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, I yield back my time. Generally yields back, Dr. Brueggemann. Wait till the clawback starts to happen to everybody that took the money. That's coming. Uh, I recognize Mr. Griffith, five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Regan, good to see you again. Uh, we met yesterday. Uh, my district is 409th out of 435 in median income for all the congressional districts. This requires uh, lots of patients to rely on copay coupons to be able to afford their medications. The Marion Family Pharmacy in Marion, Virginia, which is part of my district, um, was quoted in a CNBC article stating that patients are not able to afford their medications because their copay assistance cards were not able to be processed. I quote, we had one woman yesterday who had to pay $1,100 out of pocket because the, po the copay card wasn't working, end quote. This is not acceptable. To your knowledge, will United Health Group uh, look to uh, back and financially help those patients. And I'm not just looking about the $1,100 that, that she had to pay out of pocket. Uh, that most likely was borrowed money uh, and probably had to pay interest on it. You, have you heard anything along those lines from uh, United Health? We have not, Congressman Griffith. We would hope they would do the right thing, but we have not heard that. And, and we've got a distinguished panel here. Has anybody heard anything about them coming back in? Forget the interest for a minute. Has anybody heard anything about them just reimbursing these these folks who were harmed by the the hacking incident, which may not have been uh, what they wanted, but but it was not living up to the did not fulfill their contractual obligations with the various patients. Would you agree with that, Mr. Riggi? I would agree. I see a number of other people nodding as well. 
Um, your background with uh, the FBI and uh, your expertise in cybersecurity issues, uh, I'm just going to get right to it. Is it. You think that there's something that United Health could have done as a, to have a backup ready? I mean, aren't aren't we living in a world where the initial hack might ought to be expected and therefore an immediate backup to protect patients, particularly when you're talking about things that give me life saving? Well, not having course visibility into their network and purely speculating, but with a company that size, with the immense amount of resources that they have, the largest healthcare technology company in the world, we would expect that they would be using the most advanced, redundant, resilient technology to prevent an attack like this, which impacted so many Americans and risked their data, but risked patient care as well. Yeah, and it's, it's um, the data is disturbing. The patient care is shocking. Uh, so I do appreciate that. Um, Mr. Sheldon, as you mentioned, the fiscal year pre 25 president's, president's budget request for HHS hints at potentially penalizing hospitals starting in fiscal year 29 if they do not adopt essential cybersecurity practices. Do you think these penalties should be expanded to not just hospitals but insurance companies or anyone who touches sensitive medical information and cares for patients? Thank you for the question. From my perspective, looking at many different industries, there's been a lot of development in recent years on advancing new obligations, new regulations, um, in particular to report breaches. And um, because some of these things are developing in parallel, it'll be interesting to see how they shake out, whether there are um, gaps or redundancies in them. I think it's worth thinking about those incentives. It's also worth thinking about how to provide resources, especially to places like hospitals that may just lack the resources to do something that they know they ought to do and really want to do. Yeah, I appreciate that. Mr. McLean. On March 26, you, you claimed that Chimes sent a letter to HHS Secretary Becerra regarding the need for more details and information on the cyber attack. Has uh, HHS responded to your letter, or has HHS been in, communica in communication with you to help mitigate the attack? Um, we, we have been in communication with them. I don't know if they've responded specifically to our, our letter. Um, but we didn't uh, receive the same response to previous attacks that we uh, expected, and so there was a delay in that, and we would like to uh, have better communication in the future, as recommended in our, our testimony. All right. I appreciate that. Um, United Health Group is now claiming that 95% of their claims are flowing uninterrupted. Uh, this is a number I've asked them specifically with a letter I sent along with uh, Mr. Guthrie, do you agree with their 95% claims of flowing statement? Because I'm hearing somewhat different on, out in the, in the hustings. Uh, I don't have a good read on that. I don't know if anyone else on the panel is on here. Anybody else have a read My on that? My understanding that, that might have been uh, related to the claims they had in their network, not to the claims that were going into the pipeline. And so it's, it's giving a false impression to the public that everything's almost back to normal. Is that fair? I think that would be a fair statement. All right, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back, recognize Mr. Crenshaw, five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for this important hearing. And we, we often talk about cybersecurity uh, on both of my committees, this one and the Intel Committee. And uh, it really just gets back to the, the, to the same fundamental question, which is, okay, we're, we're legislators. We make laws. What do you want us to do about it? And um, because, because we have to make a, a few considerations here, we, we could establish we could establish a bunch of um, uh, cybersecurity standards, whatever that means. What, what does that mean? I mean, uh, everybody has to have a certain password with you know, certain characters. I, I don't know. It could mean a lot of things. Uh, the cyber experts would know. But then we have to consider: do we do we forcefully apply that to all practices across the healthcare sector? It makes sense when you know it's 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 a huge and uh, impactful entity like United, it makes a little less sense with it when it's a private practice that might have a lot of trouble putting those kind of standards in place. And so those are the kind of things we have to consider. And, and, and generally, if we're going to force something, it should be because there's a market failure and the market itself doesn't have the incentives to do it themselves. So those are all the things I think about when we talk about um, imposing st in, uh, standards. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware of a, of a specific piece of legislation that we're considering uh, that, 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 that goes in that direction at all. Um, this is obviously an informational hearing where we can just talk about it. And so 
maybe comment on what I just said and, and give us some suggestions. What do you actually want us to do? And, and I looked at my former FBI and former DHS uh, folks here to, to maybe answer that question. Maybe we can start with you, Mr. Riggi. Sure, appreciate the question. I think we have to be very thoughtful and methodical on how we proceed. In the current pending um, thoughts on imposing cybersecurity standards purely for hospitals would not have prevented the United Healthcare change attack. We were the victims, collateral damage, and more importantly, our patients were the collateral damage mm -hmm. here. So whatever strategy- well, why, can, you, can you explain technically why that's, why that's the case? Why, wouldn't it, why would it have not prevented it? Because the attack originated with United. So- That was like internal? Excuse me? Go ahead. Uh, so United was the target of the attack. Right. The current standards that are being proposed are only targeted towards hospitals. I see, I see. So if we implemented all the standards, that still would not have prevented the United attack. Okay. So again, proceeding there, thinking about a holistic approach, whatever that strategy is, of course, we want to incentivize hospitals. Hospitals are going to need a lot of resources to help meet the standards to help defend themselves. We need better secure technology as well. We need the third parties to comply with whatever the standards are. We need better information exchange with the government. And as I always say, the government's got to do more on offense. You know better than most when you have mm -hmm. foreign bad guys beyond the reach of law enforcement, and the government's got to use all their well, and, and this, the, I always get back to this question, which is, okay, if you have a murderer in your house or a burglar, what do you do? You call 911 and there's immediate action right. response. That, 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 there's, there's no parallel for cyber. I think we're, the F, people think they can call the FBI, but the FBI is going to come and collect evidence and, and maybe build a case later. Am I correct? That's correct. Uh, CISA would be the uh, supposed to be potentially the on-site actor, but even then, I mean, what are they really doing against a, an active ransomware attack? You know, uh, tracking down the bad guys and then kicking down their door. Like, is that that doesn't exist? Can it exist? Is that even possible? Um, is that what the government should be thinking about? Uh, that is one of our recommendations, to, to find a way to have a, a more reflexive, um, rapid response capability uh, from, from the government. Um, what the Congress can do uh, is to explore that. Congress did a good thing in terms of incentives back in 2021 with enactment of what became Public Law 116.321. It told HHS, when it's enforcing a data breach, to consider the extent to which the, the breached entity had over the past year implemented good cybersecurity practices. The NIST cybersecurity framework, the 405D health industry cyber practices, you do the right thing, we'll take that into consideration. Maybe the fines will be lower, the audits will be less severe. Mm -hmm. You can have similar types of, Congress doesn't need to legislate specific cybersecurity controls. Um, that is not within your expertise, but there are widely recognized cybersecurity controls that can be a reference for positive incentives. Do the right thing. If, if CMS is the reimbursement authority, well, if you do the right thing, maybe we'll give you a little bump in your reimbursement. Okay, that's, that's the money that mm. is really what, what is driving. That's an interesting uh, suggestion. Uh, I'm out of time. I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Not on your side. We'll go to Mr. Fluger from Texas for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and for allowing me to wave on. I serve on the Homeland Security Committee as well, so we talk a lot about CISA. We talk a lot about information sharing, and really the point of most of these questions have been asked, but um, you know, I kind of want to get to the heart of where, what are we missing? What do we need to do in the future? Uh, and so, Mr. McQueen, I'll start with you. You're know, talking a lot about uh, change healthcare's attack. Um, but, you know, maybe just describe the biggest vulnerability in the current landscape that we face right now that's unaddressed. Sure, it's, it's wide and varied. Thanks for the question. We've, we've spent a lot of time and energy talking about promoting interoperability in healthcare over the last dozen to, to 15 years. And, of course, that was about um, more efficiency, uh, better outcomes, better quality of care, those types of um, initiatives. We found out in February we're interoperable in the payment space, right? Um, so I think uh, what was introduced in the testimony by Mr. Garcia is this uh, idea of a, of a review, a mapping of what's happening in the healthcare system. So I think a, a lot of the discussion was today about how we, we can't necessarily mitigate all the risks, all the varying risks. Um, there, there's no complete cyber defense. But um, having this situation where 
we understand the mappings and, you know, again, very large transactions going through change, right? And yes, change should have known all of, all of those. It's only recently that they give a list of all the payers that were involved, so it's very difficult for people to respond to that. But I think that, that nationwide mapping of, of what is happening, where the transactions are going, and giving our providers and payers alternatives uh, when these kinds of situations happen. So there, there would not be um, a reliance on one, one organization as a single point of failure. Two minutes is not enough time to answer these questions, I understand. Uh, Mr. Garcia, I, I represent a district. We've got 23 hospitals, 20 counties, many of them small and rural, some large. Um, when we're talking about rural and the dissemination of information from the sector, uh, what can we do to improve? And I've got three or four more questions I'm trying to get to, so please. Uh, for, the, for the rural systems, they're, they're going to need some kind of a cyber safety net uh, for them, whether it's a series of, of, of grant programs or subsidies or incentives from the government, but, but also uh, regional networks of health providers uh, on the private sector side, because they are interdependent, interconnected in so many ways, they can be a mutual support system. Um, Mr. Rigi is a, is a hot, well, how did change healthcare's, um, the, the attack on change healthcare system affect hospitals, health systems, um, and I'll, I'll go to you, Mr. Rigi, on, you know, sure. how did it affect the ability to provide health care? Obviously, the first initially, we were the most concerned about was the impact to patient care. So understanding who had insurance, what insurance, getting pre-authorizations, pharmacy, that was remedied fairly soon within a week or two. Then, of course, the revenue cycle. So the, the lack of ability to submit claims and receive claims uh, created additional burden and, quite frankly, diverting resources from patient care. Do, does the system have training in place so that just normal, everyday people who are working within the system, and I'm going to go to you, Dr. Brueggemann, here in just a second, but is there training in place to identify this to be able to say, hey, I think we've got an issue here and, and the reporting is quick? So initially, our reporting, we did understand from hospitals right away there was a problem because they lost connectivity to their service to change its health care service. So, Immediately, they began notifying us. We had contact with the government. They were aware of separately. And then they began to try to figure out what the impact would be. Mm. Dr. Brueggemann is a provider. How did it affect your ability and, and that of other providers to, uh, to do healthcare practice? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it significantly impacted our ability for revenue cash flow, right? And, and many of us have only a few weeks to maybe a month of cash flow on hand. And the result of this, reducing our cash flow, put people in a very difficult position to provide the care, whether, how they were going to make payroll, how they were going to keep their doors open, how they were going to pay rent, and ultimately impacted patient care by patients receiving inappropriate bills that had not been uh, corrected as a result of the payments from the insurance companies. So let me just ask a general question. What, what sort of information sharing... Um, needs to either be enhanced or, you know, how can we better work with agencies like the FBI, CISA, and other federal agencies that are, are looking at this and, and may not be able to get the information to you? What do you need? I think I'll just opine quickly. In the spirit of the uh, 2015 Cybersecurity Sharing Act called for automated indicator sharing, automated sharing of malware signatures, and we're, the government's done a great job at disseminating reports more frequently, but we need to have this done on an automated basis, almost like an antivirus service. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thanks for letting me wave on, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Seeing no other members present for uh, questions, I guess that concludes our question period. I really appreciate your time and effort and the knowledge that you have here. We had a lot of sensitive things that were trying to figure out and deal with and how we respond to it. And this has been extremely helpful. So thank you. Thank you for your time. And you agree, so yeah, but thank you for, I do. you want a couple well, of words? I, uh, again, uh, all of our gratitude uh, to each one of you. As I said earlier, your testimonies have been highly instructive. And uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding that the CEO of, uh, of United Healthcare has agreed to come in, so uh, uh, we uh, won't have to use a, uh, a subpoena, uh, but I, I, this really deserves a, a strong response by the Congress. I mean, this is, this is the outrageousness of this is, uh, it, uh, you know, it, 
every time someone speaks, you put a multiplier on it. And um, uh, so we, we need to address this. And I, I think with the uh, testimony today, you've enriched us in terms of deep background and experience uh, that we can come up with a bill um, that really fits the bill here. Uh, because this is, um, uh, it's too important a sector. It's an entire sector. And um, so thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. And, I, and you I said Mr. Garcia members. represented Palo Alto well here today. Huh? Oh, yes, he Thanks. did. Well, I know it's been long. Not so a I'll surprise take... <laughs> for my district, right? We all uh, should acknowledge that. Because she said that earlier. Not, not to diminish the testimony of anyone else. Thank well, you, thank Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you. And we we all love the ones from our district well, more than we love you all, but the yeah. ones from our district more. This is a more. bipartisan issue. This is not a partisan issue. So uh, 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 from our side of the aisle, we will uh, work with you to address this, and our country and its people are going to be better off when we do. So thank you. Thanks. So now I'll ask unanimous consent to insert in the record the documents included on the staff hearing documents list. I believe what Mr. McLean is... Your statement was included in that. So, mm -hmm. so without objection, that will be in order. And I want to remind members, so you may have extra questions in writing. I have members have 10 days to submit the questions for the record, and I ask the witnesses to respond promptly. Members should submit their questions by the close of business on April 30th. So without objection, the subcommittee is adjourned.